Well, good afternoon, everybody. The Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation will now come to order. Uh, you may have seen that uh, the title of today's hearing is the reauthorization of the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act Oversight of Fisheries Management Successes and Challenges. Um, I'm Senator Dan Sullivan. I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I have the good fortune of being named at the beginning of this most recent Congress the chairman of the Senate's Commerce Committee's uh, Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmospheres, Fisheries, and the Coast Guard, which has jurisdiction over our nation's fisheries in federal waters. And this is the first field hearing uh, that the subcommittee is doing anywhere in the United States, and of course, you're not surprised that we're doing it here in Alaska. Um, with me today, uh, I have two staff members, professional staff members from the Senate Com uh, Commerce Committee, Emily Petralia and Cindy Qualley, along with uh, staff members in my office, Tom Mansour, who's a Coast Guard officer on detail to my office, Scott Lathard, who's the staff director of the subcommittee, Elena Spraker, who many of you know from my Kenai office, and my chief of staff in Washington, D.C., Joe Baylash, who some of you may know on a very different but important topic to the state of Alaska, has recently been named by the president to be the assistant secretary of interior in charge of all oil, gas, minerals, onshore, offshore, not only for Alaska, but the entire country. So Joe will uh, be going through his confirmation hearing in, in the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, chaired by Senator Rakowski, uh, in a couple weeks. So we'll be losing Joe, uh, but America and Alaska will be gaining a strong advocate uh, for our state and the country on some very, very important issues that we're not going to be talking about today, but I just want you to know that. Um, today's hearing is the second in a series of hearings that I'm chairing, which focuses on the long overdue reauthorization of the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, we shorthandedly refer to it as the MSA, to examine this law's impact on managing our nation's fisheries, uh, its successes, of which there are many, and areas of improvement. And again, I first want to start by thanking our hosts. Uh, Gary, thank you, and the Kenai Peninsula College. Um, I also want to thank the Kenai River Sporting Association for their help in organizing this Im important event. Uh, this year, the Kenai River Classic celebrates 25 years of raising funds for conservation, education, and other projects in South Central Alaska, and I wish the organizers another very successful event week. I also want to thank everybody from being, for being here today. Uh, we have an all-star list of witnesses who are going to be testifying on uh, three different panels today. Um, this is an important hearing. I know that many of you traveled uh, throughout parts of Alaska to be here, and some of you have traveled literally thousands of miles from the lower 48 to be here, and I want to personally thank everybody for the travel, sacrificing their time, even, sa even sacrificing their time out on the water, fishing. Um, earlier this month, I chaired a hearing in Washington, D.C. that solicited testimony from the Reg Regional Fisheries Management Councils and NOAA. And today, what our intention is, is to have the opportunity to broaden the amount of testimony and witnesses and different points of views dramatically from all kinds of different stakeholders in our fisheries. You know, one of the things that I just want to emphasize, this is an area where I see significant bipartisan uh, opportunities. Uh, one thing, I, when I'm back home, I, I, I try to talk about what's going on in Washington, and you often only hear about the conflict and where things are not working. There's also a lot of things that are working from a bipartisan perspective. I'll just mention one that relates to fisheries. We had a bill 
called the Save Our Seas Act, uh, recently passed the Senate. Uh, that came out of the committee uh, that I chair. It was a bill that I authored, but it had numerous Democrats and Republicans dealing with a really important issue that relates to this topic, and that's the issue of ocean pollution, ocean debris, and uh, you can't help but see that throughout our state. So there's progress there. Um, we want to make sure that as we look at reauthorizing this bill that we hear from as many impacted stakeholders as possible to make sure that we can build consensus, uh, to make sure that the next generation of young men and women in our fisheries, whether in Alaska or throughout the country, uh, have opportunities for strong, sustainable fisheries and strong, vibrant coastal communities. So when you look at the witness list, it literally covers the Pacific Northwest, Southeast United States, and every corner of Alaska, from Southeast to the interior, and Kodiak, and everywhere in between. We're fortunate today to host a robust group of witnesses representing both geographic diversity and, importantly, a diversity of experiences and perspectives. In addition, I'm eager to hear from our state and regional federal managers to gain their views on management successes, challenges, and how Congress can provide additional direction or tools to further their mission and enhance state and federal coordination, which is so, so critical with regard to our fisheries to enable them to thrive for the next generation, whether they are commercial, recreational, charter, or subsistence. The MSA has successfully Americanized our fisheries and built the fishing industry into Alaska's largest private employer. A lot of people even in Alaska don't realize that, more than any other industry. And as I constantly and perhaps annoyingly remind my Senate colleagues back in Washington, D.C., Alaska's fisheries are by far the largest in the nation accounting for well over 50% of all total domestic landings in the country. We literally are the superpower of seafood and probably considered the best managed fishery, certainly not without its challenges, but the best managed fishery in the United States and probably in the world. At the same time, we know that we have challenges and we know that we have opportunities and we see them even this summer most Alaskans, I've been out doing my fair share of fishing this summer, was on the Yukon River where my wife's family has had a subsistence fish camp for generations, saw a strong run there, was out fishing in Seward, saw a lot of opportunities out there, and just yesterday was in King Cove and saw a strong fishery uh, there. In 2017, we saw a near record sockeye run in Bristol Bay. Meanwhile, Southeast Alaska is experiencing unprecedented closure of sport and commercial king salmon fishery. And the sport king fishery in the upper Copper River was closed this year. As I noted, the Yukon River saw the best king fishery since 2003, while the Kuskokwim saw few kings, but an abundance of reds and chums. The Gulf of Alaska saw an early closure for some ground fish species. These are just a few observations, some challenges related to management, while others are a function of biology, and I think our witnesses are going to help us understand these better. The key is providing the greatest overall benefit to the U.S., the entire country, through recreational opportunity and seafood harvest without jeopardizing conservation, and that is the greatest responsibility that Congress has assigned to our fishery managers through the MSA. This requirement is often a strained balancing act, and we recognize that, and forces tough choices between competing interests. But again, I think what we're trying to do here is look at ways to achieve consensus. At a recent hearing in Washington, Chris Oliver, the newly appointed Assistant Administrator for NOAA Fisheries, the Director of the National Marine Fisheries Service, NIMPS, and I'm proud to say the first ever Alaskan to permanently hold that position, testified as follows. Quote, I believe there are opportunities to have it both ways, 
to maximize our domestic harvest potential without compromising the long-term sustainability of the resources we manage. So for many Alaskans and their families, fishing is a way of life. As Congress considers the reauthorization of the MSA, we are focused on seeking the sort of solutions that Chris Oliver has confidence exists. I hope today's hearing will further guide us towards that goal. I am committed to ensuring that our nation's fisheries management system supports a stable food supply, recreational subsistence opportunities, and plentiful fishing and processing jobs that provide for vibrant coastal communities here in Alaska, but also across the United States. And with that, I'd like to get started and uh, turn to our first panel, which consists mostly of state and federal officials and the public management bodies that make decisions with regard to our fisheries. So I want to welcome our witnesses, Dan Hall, who's the chair of the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, Commissioner Sam Cotton, who is the commissioner of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, Reed Morsky, member of the Alaska Board of Fisheries, and Spud Woodward, director of the Coastal Resources Division, Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Dr. Woodward, I think you might get the award for traveling the furthest. So we want to thank you for being here as well. Each of you will have five minutes to deliver an oral statement and a longer written statement will be included in the record for this hearing uh, if you so wish. That also reminds me this hearing will be open in terms of the record for two weeks and we would uh, encourage any and all and we will leave the, the contact information for additional testimony from any members of the audience who would like to submit written testimony that we will look at, read, I promise you, and consider as part of this hearing, even though you weren't uh, able to testify as one of the witnesses today. So uh, each of you, as I mentioned, will have five minutes. We look forward to uh, interesting discussion. And again, I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. Uh, Dan, can you please kick it off? Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Sullivan, Ranking Member Peters, and members of the committee. First, thank you for holding this field hearing in Alaska and for the opportunity to testify on the reauthorization of the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, or MSA as we say in shorthand. My name is Dan Hall and I'm chairman of the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Fisheries are extremely important to the economies, coastal communities, and cultures in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest and we have developed a sustainable fisheries management program in Alaska over the last 40 years. Thus, the North Pacific Council believes that the current MSA and the 10 national standards already provide a very successful framework for the conservation and management of our nation's fisheries resources. Nevertheless, we also recognize the potential benefits of increased flexibility in some circumstances to allow regional councils the opportunity to optimize their management programs with the appropriate cautionary notes. We agree with and support the Council Coordinating Committee's consensus positions on MSA reauthorization provided by Dr. John Quinn recently, and I encourage the committee to take advantage of the collective wisdom of the CCC as work on reauthorization moves ahead. I want to highlight several issues in particular, beginning with modifications to the ACL requirements, which we believe are the cornerstone of sustainable fisheries management. The process for setting ACLs through the Council's scientific and statistical committees includes accounting for uncertainty, articulating policies for acceptable risk, establishing and establishing necessary precautionary buffers. We continue to believe that the SSCs are the appropriate gatekeepers for making those determinations. Any changes to the law providing additional flexibility must continue to ensure that fundamental conservation and management principles are upheld and should not create incentives or justifications to overlook them for the sake of preserving all economic activity over the short term. Second, more specific to the North Pacific region, we believe an amendment to remove the August 1st, 1996 date from MSA section 306A3C is essential to effective management and enforcement of the fisheries. 
This would ensure that the delegation of salmon management in the EEZ to the state of Alaska would include vessels not registered with the state. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I also want to correct um, my written statement on the recusal issue to reflect that continuation of the full attribution policy is a NOAA agency decision and not a decision by NOAA GC alone. Uh, next, incorporating the National Environmental Protection Act requirements into the MSA to achieve a single guiding statute for fisheries management is consistent with the longstanding views of our council and the CCC. However, we are concerned that the ultimate result will be contingent upon implementing regulations and realized benefits could be marginal relative to creation of new complexities and costs. In our view, this issue uh, certainly deserves closer scrutiny. Lastly, we concur with the CCC's concerns regarding the challenges that councils face to meet important new national policy directives and the adequacy of funding to continue at sea surveys and stock assessments. In the North Pacific, the high quality and coverage levels of fishery surveys and stock assessments have been essential in achieving sustainable fisheries for so long. With reductions in surveys and stock assessments, it becomes harder to achieve optimum yield in the fisheries as defined in National Standard 1. Greater uncertainty in estimates of abundance typically results in more conservative approaches to management and lowest har lower harvest levels to buffer against the potential for error and maintain conservation goals. My written testimony also includes four examples of successful fisheries management in the North Pacific under the existing MSA. Chinook bi salmon bycatch management in the Bering Sea, the observer program and development of electronic monitoring, the management of hal halibut allocations between the commercial and charter sectors, and the development of ecosystem-based fisheries management. No management program is perfect upon implementation, and all of them require review and revision over time. But all of these actions have been possible under the existing structure of the law, and there are several important underlying themes in all of them. First, the significance of a well-structured national policy framework that provides broad objectives with sound guidance, recognizing regional differences and allow allowing for the development of regionally-based solutions. Second, the critical importance of science and analysis in stock surveys, assessments, fisheries-dependent data collection and monitoring, and research, including social and economic research. And finally, ensuring accountability in all that we do through monitoring and data collection in the fisheries, review of catch share and other management programs, and broad stakeholder participation. Chairman Sullivan, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. That concludes my remarks, and I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Commissioner Cotton. are visiting. <clears throat> I'll, I'll supplement my written comments too and uh, note that uh, uh, and I'm sure you're well aware that uh, the seafood industry is extremely important to our state's economy and especially to the economies of our, fish of our fishing communities. Uh, Magnuson uh, has worked well here in Alaska for the most part and we'd ask your committee and the U.S. Congress to avoid imposing programs here in Alaska outside the council process in either this or other legislation that could result in promoting consolidation, restricting competition in the processing industry, making access to fisheries more difficult for our uh, resident fishermen, or generally having a negative impact on our fishing community's economies. And we would ask you to se seek the support of the state and our fishing communities before creating any new programs for Alaska. On the subject of uh, state management of salmon, tanner crab, lingcod, and some rockfish species in the uh, uh, economic zone, uh, a recent court decision has caused us some concern, and the state of Alaska has appealed a Ninth Circuit court decision that would require federal intervention in the management of Alaska salmon fisheries. Hmm. One key point in the case is when a federal plan is when a federal plan is required. Both Alaska and NIMPS uh, feel uh, the interpretation of the law suggests that a federal intervention is not needed if the fish are currently managed by the state. Both Alaska, the Council, and the National Marine Fisheries Service currently feel that state management of salmon is satisfactory and meets all national standards. 
The courts interpreted the statute to suggest that you always need a federal plan if you're in the EEZ. So that's the difference of opinion there. Uh, we think it's not only important here in Alaska for salmon, but as I mentioned, uh, the state also manages tanner crab in the EEZ, lingcod, two different species of rockfish, and I'm told that uh, other states would face similar potential problems, uh, uh, specifically pink shrimp on the west coast of the U.S. are managed by states but occur in the EEZ and could also uh, be uh, subject to a challenge as we have seen in, in, the, um, in the salmon here. And just, just generally, Cook Inlet salmon management is fairly complicated, always controversial, uh, difficult to satisfy all 10 or 12 different interest groups uh, in, in those fish. And to add the United States government as a player in that, on that scene, I do not think would be helpful or a positive addition. Um, on the recusal question, my written comments, I think, cover the, 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 uh, the comments I wanted to make. I, I'm led to believe that it's uh, really uh, a matter of NOAA policy guidance that is uh, uh, guiding that, that, th those decisions on when members have to be recused. And it got a little bit ridiculous at this last meeting when one of the members was required to recuse, be recused on an on a, on a FMP that had to do with uh, essential fish habitat that no way would have benefited either him or his company personally. So we think that needs a, 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 a stronger look, and I'm not sure if it needs legislation, but uh, it would encourage you and your committee to uh, work with Noah on that question. And finally, uh, not on the subject of Magnuson itself, but on a related topic as far as uh, the council's concerned, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, you know, some money problems with observer coverage. So like a lot of uh, programs in state government and federal government, money is an issue, but it's really important, we feel, to improve and increase the observer coverage, uh, especially in the Gulf of Alaska, <clears throat> just because uh, uh, we could get better information, <clears throat> but would also improve the confidence that people could have in the statistics that we now uh, see as a result of a very low uh, level of coverage in, in some of our fisheries there. So. I know it's a, it's a tough time for everybody as far as money is concerned, but uh, this is a, a really important one. I wanted to highlight that one area that could, we could really use some help with funding. So uh, with that, uh, I'll just say that, uh, uh, oh, just on that subject, uh, the uh, Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission just finished their meeting today, and they passed a resolution supported unanimously by all five states to also encourage additional funding for observer programs. So thank you again for being here. and. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner Cotton. Uh, Mr. Morsky. Thank you, Senator. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony regarding potential improvements to the Magnuson-Stevens Act. For introduction, my name is Reed Morsky. I'm one of seven members of the Alaska Board of Fisheries. I live in Fairbanks, Alaska, where I have operated a sport fishing guide service for 34 years. I live almost 400 miles from the nearest saltwater that makes some people happy, others it gives them concern. I have a close family member that has been involved in the commercial fishing industry in Alaska for several decades. The reauthorization of the Magnus and Stevens Fishery Conservation Act offers an opportunity to address issues that affect Alaskans and others that depend on our fisheries resources. Questions relating to possible suggestions for how the current management of the MSA could be improved include Will this reauthorization process incorporate provisions for flexibility in the management of the sport fishery? There is concern that the current management structure is too rigid and does not allow for variables the industry has requested while accommodating conservation principles. Will there be an improvement in conducting comprehensive stock assessments to include real-time sport fish catch reporting? There is consensus in the sport fleet that the initial allocations in many fisheries did not adequately reflect what was being taken by the sport fleets, nor did it account for competition between user groups. Currently, every region collects different levels of information differently, and giving answers is typically voluntary. The provided information isn't easily accessible to the average fisherman. Will this be addressed? Will the current data collection program that would assist in resolving these concerns receive adequate funding? 
a great deal of additional information is needed by all user groups in the waters covered by the MSA. Will this reauthorization process address the need for better catch data and the economic value of the sport fisheries, both direct and indirect? There is a concern that future allocations, dedications of budget, personnel, and management efforts should be made with this economic information available. If the federal government takes over management of the EEZ that since statehood has been managed under state law, are they ready to determine the harvest limits for each sector? How would the differing management standards be coordinated? How would the federal management mesh with the national standards with state management? Should the national standards reflect the significant presence of sport fishing and other users? The National Marine Fishery Service has found that the Magnuson-Stevens Act concept of optimum yield is equivalent to the state's sustained yield principle. The state of Alaska mandates the fisheries resources are for the maximum benefit of people. Should the MSA be amended to accommodate multiple users? Coupled with this issue, should the MSA provide for research for freshwater fisheries? Should the MSA national standards incorporate the state of Alaska's escapement goal management strategy? And in summary, although they have similar economic impact, recreational and commercial fishing are fundamentally different activities. Recognizing that the commercial fishing industry is economically important to the U.S. economy, there are over 11 million Americans that enjoy saltwater recreational fishing. The sport contributes over $63 billion to the nation's economy annually and supports over 439,000 American jobs. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify on these important reauthorization issues. Thank you. Dr. Woodward. Thank you, Chairman Sullivan. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And it was a long trip, but a pleasant one. Thank you. I've worked in the field of fisheries management at the state level for 30 years. I've uh, served on the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, and I'm currently Georgia's Administrative Commissioner to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. While our state is the largest east of the Mississippi, uh, we have a relatively small coastline, about 100 miles, but it is one rich in natural treasures, largely thanks to the visionary leadership of state lawmakers who passed laws in the 70s to protect our estuaries and our barrier islands. I'd like to comment from a state perspective about another landmark law of the 70s, the Magnuson-Stevens Act. I'll start by stating the obvious. The Act has accomplished its original intended purpose very well, which was to protect our ocean resources from foreign fishing fleets and unregulated domestic fishing. Amendments in 1996 and 2006 were intended to keep pace with changes in domestic fishing and advances in fishery science and management. As a whole, those changes were positive and there have been notable and measurable successes in the South Atlantic, black sea bass, red porgy, king and Spanish mackerel, and protection of long-lived and slow-growing deep water corals. However, the prescriptive nature of the act has also created unintended consequences in the Southeast. Five years of a red snapper harvest moratorium and a total of 17 days of allowable harvest since 2010 have left our citizens who fished the South Atlantic totally dismayed. The same can be said for the thousands of Georgians who fished the Gulf of Mexico for red snapper when they learned that federal waters were only going to be open for three days in 2017. Fortunately, state and federal authorities reached an agreement to extend that season. However, as of today, the South Atlantic remains closed to the harvest of red snapper, despite a marked increase in abundance to the point that discards and now not harvest is actually the management challenge. Mm -hmm. Estimates of dead discards, albeit imprecise, have actually exceeded the annual catch limit and perpetuated closures, leading to lost fishing opportunities. Adding to our anglers' frustrations, NOAA Fisheries closed federal waters in the South Atlantic to the recreational harvest of Atlantic Migratory Group Cobia this year. This decision was made as a precautionary measure to prevent the recreational harvest from exceeding the annual catch limit of 620,000 pounds. It's important to note that Cobia are not overfished and are not undergoing overfishing. The Cobia fishery in Georgia is prosecuted almost exclusively in federal waters and accounts for about 15% of the annual recreational catch. By comparison, over 80% of the recreational catch of the Atlantic Migratory Group occurs in the state waters of North Carolina and Virginia, which remained open to harvest. So the closure uh, through the Magnuson Act was in essence a de facto allocation of Cobia to those states made in full recognition of the uncertainty associated with recreational catch estimates. So our anglers lost a fishing opportunity without there being a commensurate conservation benefit or need. 
The act is currently applied has made it difficult for the regional councils in the southeast to adapt fishery management to the needs of a very diverse recreational fishery. We deal with dozens and dozens of species in mixed uh, populations. Uh, council members need flexibility and alternative management measures in their toolbox. I predict that you'll hear from some that flexibility and alternative management measures are simply ways to avoid making difficult but necessary management decisions. I disagree. I think they're necessary tools. Council members and staff also need more assessments that are both timely and suitable as a basis for management decisions. Stock assessments are the backbone of good fishery management. But it's important to point out that there is one NOAA Fishery Science Center supporting three councils, ICAT, and highly migratory species in the southeast. Hmm. Uh, finally, it's time for a realistic acknowledgement that for many species, the Marine Recreational Information Program simply lacks the temporal and spatial resolution, accuracy, and precision needed for sophisticated stock assessment models and for recreational quota monitoring. We need more advanced tools. Congress has an opportunity to amend the act to improve the ability of regional councils to manage the nation's marine recreational fisheries. We know that you and your colleagues have many issues competing for your time and attention, and we very much appreciate those who have introduced and sponsored bills to amend the Magnuson-Stevens Act. We look forward to working with Congress to see them to fruition. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Woodward, from traveling all the way from Georgia. I hope you get a little opportunity to go out fishing on the Kenai here. Uh, 5.30 in the morning, I hope. Uh, there we go. <laughs> good, good. Um, well, listen, let me, let me begin with just a very uh, open-ended question, but in many ways it's the key issue that we're looking at um, in this hearing. And I'll just open it up to any or all of the witnesses to begin with, but what do you hope to see in an MSA reauthorization and what issues in particular um, would you see as your top priorities uh, with regard to an MSA reauthorization? We've heard from different user groups saying, hey, it's working well, do no harm. Uh, others have had a very different view in terms of what uh, what they want out of this. So I just really want to open that up to begin with uh, for all the witnesses here today. And again, I want to thank the witnesses for their testimony, and we want to continue to work with all of you as we move forward in this process. I think one, one of the primary concerns we have is, is the prescriptive nature in terms of ending overfishing and rebuilding. You know, the Act, uh, when it was amended in 2006 and reauthorized in 2007, had very good intentions to set measurable goals. The problem is we're, we're applying those goals across very diverse fish species and fish populations, and sometimes it's simply impossible to rebuild some of these stocks back, especially if they're long-lived species in the period of time allocated and mandated by the, by the law. And, and to do that, if it's even feasible, oftentimes comes with socioeconomic costs that are devastating. Yeah. And you still can't necessarily accomplish your goal, but you're inflicting great harm. And so I think that's where the flexibility comes in to have, you know, original councils were created to be a, a composite body of informed decision makers. And, and they do need, you know, flexibility in their ability to do that. And I think the act, for all of its good intentions, has taken away some of that flexibility and keeps them from being able to do the best job they can. So your focus is on more flexibility to the council in terms of decision making that relates to specific quota allocations? And, and, and validate, well, let's, let's remove annual catch limits when they aren't necessarily the appropriate tool. And let's give flexibility to build stocks back over longer periods of time to properly balance the socioeconomic cost with rebuilding. And then, uh, you know, we also need better information. I mean, you've heard from Commissioner Cotton about funding. I mean, we have one fishery science center, and, and the states in the southeast, you know, um, have various levels of funding, and we don't have the capacity necessarily to produce those kind of stock assessments, but they are the currency of modern fishery yeah. management. So we've got to have that, too. Great. Others uh, want to comment on the first question? Dan? Thank you, Senator. Um, I did touch on um, one specific issue in my uh, oral comments on the North Pacific management clarification related to pr 
provisions over uh, state jurisdiction to manage fishing activity in the absence of official fishery management plan. We as a, a council did, have not met since the invitation to this um, hearing, so, um, so my uh, oral and written comments are based on our previous discussions of Magnuson issues generally, and we have not taken the opportunity to more specifically identify changes that we would, that we would offer. Um, the, with respect to flexibility and, uh, and rebuilding plans, we do identify um, the, the need to, um, to look into that in such a way that, again, as I said in my oral testimony, we can provide the regional councils with, with some of the flexibility that they need uh, to rebuild stocks um, and to meet, um, to meet the scientific pr principles of, uh, surrounding ACLs, but, but also the social and economic objectives that, the, that each region experiences differently. And we've heard that in the, in the it's seen that in, uh, from other councils with respect to wreck fisheries. Um, again, we noting some uh, caution and caution about how those might um, be changed. Those are issues generally that we see are, are worth exploring. Great, Commissioner Cotton. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I think I'm probably in the camp of uh, working well, do no harm, as yeah. reflected in a lot of my testimony. But uh, I will take this opportunity to do another pitch on on budget budget items. Um, in the state of Alaska, as I'm sure everybody's aware, we're, we're facing some constraints on uh, uh, revenues, and, and as a result, uh, all, all budgets are under close scrutiny. And I think the legislature this year treated our budget fairly well. I've come to the recognition that in order for us to do our job, we, we do need those financial resources. And as you take them away, we're less able to do a good job. And the same is true here. And I think the gentleman from Georgia pointed out that, uh, you know, a similar concern from, from that part of the country. So again, uh, appreciate uh, uh, strong attention to the, uh, to, to the budget. And I know there's a, there's a push to make reductions in the Department of Commerce and that will affect us. So uh, uh, I know you're aware of this, but just wanted to echo and, and emphasize our concern for uh, certainly the potential for reductions and yeah. And at least in one case, we, we're, we're interested in additional resources. Thank you. Well, I can uh, I can assure you that at least from my perspective, full funding for NOAA and NIMS, and particularly the research and data collection component of what they're doing for our fisheries, has been something that I've been advocating for since I got to the Senate. As you all know, you can't manage a fishery well if you don't have accurate and robust data. And so um, I will continue to press for that, but I appreciate you uh, raising it here. Mr. Mariski, do you have any, any issues, again, with regard to kind of broader hope to see in a MSA reauthorization and kind of from your perspective, what would be most important? Um, I, I'll also confirm that uh, budgetary issues in, in regards to uh, um, what I'm seeing is that uh, on the state level and, and hearing also about the federal level, the, the uh, lack of funding for science and research, uh, in particular on, on uh, um, fish runs, it will, it will equate to uh, less accurate uh, management and, and default to uh, a more conservative management regime. So uh, I am concerned about that as well. Thank you. Let me turn to another issue that um, uh, Mr. Hall, you mentioned, Commissioner Cotton, you touched on, um, but there have been a notable uptick uh, on the North Pacific uh, Council's decision making with regard to recusals. And can you just give the committee and others a sense of how that complicates uh, the work of the Council? and? You both touched on it. You believe that that's a no uh, regulatory approach that can address that, or is that something you think we need to look at from a legislative perspective, if you think it's a problem at all? We've been hearing, of course, a number of concerns about that. Thank you, Senator. Yes, there 
there do seem to be have been an increase in uh, the recusals, um, specifically for, um, or especially for the CDQ representatives um, on our council. Um, and, and this is... And isn't it a bit ironic because isn't part of the reason to have the council put together, you want to choose members who actually are involved in the in the industry and involved in fisheries issues and know, know a lot about it, which kind of raises the issue of recusal, even though it also raises the issue of knowledge. That's, that's correct, Senator. Uh, they've been successful um, over the past 25 years getting involved in all the fisheries. Therefore, they, they do bring a, a perspective that is both unique and uh, very broad uh, for the, the council and not having um, them, not, not allowing them to add their voice to our collective decision making is uh, frustrates, uh, we believe, the congressional intent for, for the program. Yeah, Commissioner Kahn. Thank you, yeah, I, th I think that I really appreciate the fact that you're asking a question on that. I mean, it suggests that you're, you're aware of the, of, the, of the problems here. Uh, in the past, there had been other people that had been told that they would be uh, required to be recused, and what they did uh, to, to fix that was they shuffled their employment status, removed themselves as an employee, became a consultant, or some other method of, it's the same person sitting there with the same financial interest, but it, and they were able to avoid. And that, uh, and that worked previously? That, that, that did work. Okay. And I apologize if I'm paraphrasing in a way that might have missed a couple of important points there, but that, that was my observation at, at the very least. CDQ uh, the, uh, organizations don't have a designated seat on the council, but they typically, somebody from a CDQ organization typically sits on the council. And it's a very important part of the, the economy in Alaska and especially the Western Alaska. So that's the person that's most often been recused and it's possible that whoever s sits there representing CDQ groups would face the same kind of problem. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very important seat. And, and parochially, uh, you know, the, the, the original design of the, the Magnuson Act gave Alaska six votes, recognizing yes. that out of the 11 votes, that gives Alaska a majority if we all decide to vote the same way that is. But it doesn't always work out that way. But, uh, um, but by having the CDQ member be the one that's typically recused, that threatens uh, Alaska's ability to have yeah. a strong voice on these issues. So, so you, you certainly want us to look at it, but you think that's something we should explore, whether that's regulatory or talk to NOAA, or is it something that we need to define more clearly in the statute? My recommendation, Senator, would be to, to continue to, to uh, push for a, a, a NOAA policy guidance change. If that's not successful, then uh, certainly uh, we would support a uh, change in statute. Okay. Thank you. Let me ask, um, and this again could go to either uh, Dan, uh, Dan or Mr. Hall or Commissioner Cotton. So I was, uh, you mentioned Western Alaska. I was uh, out in uh, Shishmaref the other day, and one of the, we did a town hall meeting there, and one of the questions that came up was the broader issue of kind of the um, closure of, uh, or non-fishing, of kind of the Arctic waters that extends north of where they are. And yet, a, from their perspective, some of the people asked the question, just seeing, you know, more migration, more fish. Um, I get this question asked a lot. I'm sure all of you do look at the council. But what kind of data, what kind of information, what kind of um, process do you need as you continue, continually evaluate more northern waters in Alaska in terms of what uh, the council would recommend in terms of opportunities or maybe not enough data to understand the ecosystem there in terms of fishing there. I got a couple questions on that just, uh, just two days ago and I told them I'd have the opportunity to ask the experts and that I would pitch the question to you. So um, over to both of you for that question, which f at least for me comes up uh, quite a lot when I'm talking to Alaskans. Thank you, Senator. I, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, 
I can't recall offhand what kind of surveys are currently being done in those Arctic waters that are currently closed under our Arctic F FMP to uh, better understand what um, what the s status of stocks is, what's the abundance, how, how it's been changing. And they're closed primarily because we just don't think we have the information to make intelligent decisions on any kind of management regime? In, in essence, yes. And, and so until we have that information and are better able to structure some kind of management program that would satisfy the uh, provisions of Magus and, and w the, the decision has been not to, not to open. But aren't those. we seeing a migration of fish stocks north or is that just anecdotal? Uh, Senator, I apologize. I'm not able to answer that that specifically. I, I would add, however, that uh, the North Pacific Research Board, of which I uh, am chairman as well, um, it has initiated an, uh, an integrated ecosystem research plan for the Arctic waters, not specifically to address the issue of what is the uh, stock composition and, and abundance in the Arctic waters, but to understand uh, the process for uh, the production of resources in that region that are particularly important to the people in that area. So um, that is a three year plus uh, endeavor. It's just begun this year, um, but that's an example of some of the work that I'm aware of that's going on. Commissioner Cotton, you have any views on that? Just thank you very much, Senator. Uh, that was a relatively easy decision to close the Arctic uh, for one reason, nobody was fishing there. So we really didn't take anything away from anybody. But we did say that it could be opened under certain conditions uh, and we'd have to show uh, healthy stocks that could be harvested. And one thing about the fishing industry in Alaska is they're, they're seldom shy about advancing proposals, ideas, applications for experimental fishing permits. Uh, so I, I would expect uh, to hear from industry as far as interest and th 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 they would uh, contribute to uh, research uh, and uh, do the exploration, I think, if, if they were allowed, and if they had the interest, if there was a good, good thought that there might be some um, uh, money to be made in the Arctic, so. Okay, thank you. Let me ask, uh, Commissioner, one other question. Um, are there any changes in the MSA that could benefit the relationship, and uh, Dr. Woodward, this would be to you as well, between kind of state uh, fish and game regulators and organizations and NIMS and NOAA, or do you see that relationship as working well? Do you see any kind of structural issues that might be addressed in the MSA to make that more of a cooperative relationship? Thank you. Sir. That's a very, a very good question, Senator, and, and one that's fundamental to the effectiveness of our fishery management, and, and, and you as you're aware, there have been efforts in the, in the southeast to extend state jurisdictions out to manage resources in, in the EEZ, uh, with the belief being that the state agencies had a better understanding of those fisheries and an ability to collect the data. Uh, that's a slippery slope because that does put a burden back on the states to, yeah. to be able to collect that data. Uh, from a perspective of a state like Georgia, you know, our territorial waters extend out to three miles. Uh, we have very little bottom fish habitat uh, until you get 20 to 40 miles offshore. You know, so if, if we were gonna change that relationship to realign jurisdictions, it would be a pretty significant move that would have obviously far reaching ramifications for more than just fish. Yeah. But at the same time, I can say that, that uh, especially in the situation like we're dealing with with Cobia, uh, I have been encouraged that the Southeast region has accepted that perhaps it's better for states to manage Cobia, given the preponderance of the catch that occurs in state waters, than to keep it under a federal system. Uh, and I think that's where the relationship really can benefit the most, is a willingness for NOAA to divest itself of management responsibilities when there's a justification for it. We've done it in other species. Uh, we've we've you know, reduced the number of, of, of species being managed under federal management, which is already stressed for resources, as I've already alluded to. So to me, that's where I don't know that anything particular needs to be put in the act other than maybe some language that encourages the, the councils to look critically at what is in their portfolio and to look for opportunities to pass that to the states. 
Commissioner Cotton, you have any views on that? Just to, to say generally, uh, the state of Alaska has felt that uh, we've worked very well with National Marine Fisheries Service, a representative in Alaska, and now we anticipate even a stronger working relationship yes, with, the, with, with the leadership well, nationally. And good thank news you for, for your support on that. Well, he uh, was, by the way, just so everybody knows, he was supported by every council, every region. So we had a strong Alaskan candidate, and I'm glad we got him in there. And I think many of the other people that have held that office were certainly well qualified and confident, but I think few have had the experience that uh, Mr. Oliver's had with directly hands on with councils. And so I think that's really going to be a benefit to not just our council, but, yep. but nationally. Uh, the, the, we've had some um, uh, areas that we haven't agreed on, though, and typically with the ESA issues, marine mammals, for example, especially stellar sea lions, yep. we'd, we'd come to different conclusions on a regular basis on some of those issues, but uh, still feel that. Uh, uh, overall, I'd, I'd give a, a high, high marks on uh, working relationship between state and National Marine Fisheries Service. Let me ask uh, Mr. Mariski a related council with regard to the coordination that exists between the North Pacific Council and the Board of Fish. Uh, are there ways that that um, coordination can be improved? And I'm, you know, I'm kind of putting you and Mr. Hall on the spot here. I'm sure you're going to say in the in the testimony that it's all going swimmingly, but uh, if it isn't, what what uh, what would you recommend? Well, uh, perhaps more frequent interaction. Uh, I've been on the board uh, four years now and have not um, uh, had an opportunity to have the board officially interact with, with the uh, North Council, so Well, I'm glad we could bring you guys together yes, today. Yes, well, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so perhaps a more frequent um, involvement would benefit both of us, um, especially with the uh, issues that have been raised here and, and in other venues. Do you think right now that the management tools um, the state and the Board of Fish possess um, are beneficial from the NIMPS and Council's perspective to have in their toolbox to manage both the federal in state fisheries, obviously in Alaska and more than most states, there's a there's a there's an interaction, there's an overlap. Commissioner Cotton has mentioned a couple areas where the state manages uh, stocks in federal waters. Obviously, you also mentioned the Kenai, which um, you know has its own very distinctive history in that regard. Do you think that there's enough um, proper authorities and tools that enable? that relationship to work, particularly at the kind of intersection? Well, uh, one of the comments that I've heard from my fellow board members um, is that um, it, it's interesting that the uh, North Council has their own um, staff uh, back up for uh, um, information gathering and, and research and whatnot. And, and the board, uh, although we have access to the department, uh, it would be night, and this isn't to criticize our state uh, structure here, but, but I'm just this is I'm just relaying something, and I have also the same uh, sentiment that uh, perhaps down the road, if if uh, we could have some kind of a uh, uh, more of a staff on the state side for things that that we may research that are board centric. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me close with just. Uh, one, one final question. I quoted uh, Chris Oliver in his uh, hearing just uh, last month in Washington, D.C., where he talks about, you know, there are opportunities to have it both ways, where for additional flexibility in how we apply, apply annual catch limits, subsequent accountability measures, and in those rebuilding plans where we can achieve some flexibility that people are seeking without rolling back our conservation successes in having additional overfish stocks. He thinks we can achieve that balance. As you mentioned, Commissioner is someone who comes to that position with a lot of experience. Is that something that um, all of you would agree with the new director of NIMPS that we can, we can hit that balance and sweet spot? Yeah, I'll, I'll open this. This is a final question for this panel. So. All right. So if you want to answer it or have any other comments, please feel free to if, if, make them. If I, if I might um, first make a comment regarding uh, the state board of fisheries and our council interaction. Sure. Um, we do have a joint protocol committee 
between the Board of Fisheries and, and our council, a subset of, uh, of each body. We haven't met for, I think it's been close to seven or eight years now. So we've recognized on our side the need to, to interact at times, but haven't followed through. Um, I think that there's, a, given certain circumstances now, I think we've discussed that that, that warrants a, uh, a joint meeting. Well, um, maybe that can be one positive outcome of this yeah. hearing, since we have two of the key players, actually three of the key players, uh, to, to do that. We, we also, uh, our staff does uh, brief the, the Board of Fish on issues that that um, are going through our council that are relevant to, um, to issues that they've taken up. So there is some interaction that goes on in between. But uh, with your res respect to your question um, on Mr. Oliver's statement, I think that there are potential opportunities for Im improving that the, the uh, perhaps the harvest side of the equation. Um, I, I do want to say that it does require um, an increased monitoring of our fisheries, um, improvements in our stock assessment, because the greater, the more information we have about the abundance of stocks, their distribution, their life history, the better able we are to, to make those decisions about harvest levels. Um, the, the more monitoring we have uh, of the fisheries, um, the better able we are to understand the the consequences of harvest or the impacts of harvest on those stocks. So yes, I think that there are, are some ways to do that, um, but it, it won't come easily. Um, I, I can say that um, as well. So. Thank you. Any other uh, panelists want to comment on that, that final uh, question that I pose that quotes the new director of uh, NIMPS on what he thinks we can achieve? I will. Thank you, Senator. And, and I'll just for the record let you know that uh, Mr. Oliver's origins were in the southeast. Yeah. So uh, he may be an Alaskan, but. Uh, well, I think yeah, he claims claim Texas yes, initially, we, but we yeah, claim we, him uh, now. So, so, uh, so he's, he's, he's got a lot of connections. But, uh, uh, so we, we have a little pride of ownership of him, too. Good. But, uh, but I, I do think what he has said is achievable. Uh, I think it's going to take a lot of work. I think it's more than just amending the Magnuson Act. I think it's, it's leadership within NOAA. I think it's, uh, it starts at the regional level and how regional administrators guide their staffs uh, to apply the Magnuson Act and how they interact with the regional fishery management councils. I mean, we see this quite often in our state federal agency interactions that as you move geographically, oftentimes uh, the Code of Federal Regulations is interpreted differently from place to place. Right. And sometimes that's uh, good and sometimes it's not so good. But I think it's going to take both and it's going to take uh, a commitment of resources. I mean, we're, we're trying to do very advanced fisheries management in this country, and we have got to support it with the resources necessary to perpetuate the billions of dollars of, of benefit it brings. Uh, you know, the legislation currently before the Senate and the House, the Modern Fish Act, they have great potential. Uh, obviously, we've got to look at them with close scrutiny, but I do think it's achievable. I think if the act is amended to, to show the states that, that National Marine Fisheries Service is, is extending the olive branch, so to speak, to try to bridge the gap and correct some of these problems, that there's a willingness on both sides. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Cotton. Thank you, Senator. I just wanted to say I agree with Mr. Hall and Mr. Woodward that, uh, uh, that, it, that that statement reflects something that really is achievable. And I think the big difference, and I already mentioned this, is the experience that our new director has, the leadership in that uh, and that service is, uh, is so important. And while we certainly wouldn't want anybody to abandon the, a, a cautionary approach to a lot of fisheries management uh, challenges, uh, that kind of knowledge and base would allow for, uh, I think, a bolder advance on, on a lot of things that we're all very interested in, so. Great, thank you. Mr. Mariski, I'll give you the uh, wrap-up final word here. I thank you for uh, conducting this hearing today and uh, giving us all this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, listen, how about a round of applause for our first panel? And I want to thank the witnesses again and uh, ask our uh, second panel to please come up to the dais. Thank you.
Well, I want to thank uh, our second panel, and again, I, I really want to thank everybody for being here. Your, I think the the committee and uh, uh, people observing this hearing are recognizing. You saw that distinguished first panel. Our next two panels are going to be uh, just as distinguished, representing a wide group of stakeholders from different regions, different areas. And so again, I will ask each of our witnesses uh, will be recognized um, for five minutes to give an opening statement. And if you have a longer statement, um, we can uh, uh, submit that for the record. And what we have, our, our, I would like to introduce our panel of witnesses. Uh, first, we have uh, Glenn Reed, who is the president of Pacific Seafood Processors Association. Ben Special, who's the president of Yamaha Marine Group. Linda Belkin, who's the president of the Halibut Coalition and the executive director of Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association. Ranger Alstrom, who's the executive director of the Yukon Delta Fisheries Development Association. And Ben Stevens, the director of hunting and fishing task force for Tanana Chiefs Conference. Um, each of you will have five minutes. Mr. Reed, we'll begin with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Sullivan. On behalf of the member companies of the Pacific Seafood Processors Association, or PSPA as we call ourselves, I'd like to thank you for convening today's hearing on reauthorization of the MSA. My name is Glenn Reed and I serve as the president of PSPA. Our nonprofit trade association represents the shared policy interests of nine seafood processing companies active in all major commercial fisheries in Alaska. PSPA members collectively purchase and send to market several hundred million dollars, or excuse me, 700 million pounds of fish landed in Alaska, including salmon, pollock, crab, cod, halibut, sablefish, and other fisheries that continue to achieve sustainable management under the MSA. To accomplish this, PSPA members have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in their operations, including three at sea motherships, 31 shore based facilities in 18 Alaska coastal communities from Ketchikan to Dutch Harbor to Togiak. Our members support local economies bolster the tax base of rural communities and provide thousands of jobs and infrastructure in remote locations. I want to highlight the inter interdependencies between commercial harvesters and seafood processors which define our role as key fisheries management stakeholders. The harvesting sector operates under management measures developed through the Regional Fishery Management Council process and they must be able to sell their fish quickly. PSPA members and other processors develop markets, buy those fish, turn them into value added products. Yet the value of the product largely depends on consumer demand in highly competitive seafood markets around the world. The influence of global seafood markets on primary processors, including their ability to invest in capacity and equipment necessary to remain globally competitive, must be understood and considered in management decisions in order to achieve optimum yield. Congress defined optimum yield as the harvest level that provides the greatest overall benefit to the nation, and it remains the core tenant of the MSA. Congress also defined fishing communities to include harvesters and processors, and this relationship is critical to realizing the benefits of optimum yield, which are further distributed throughout coastal communities and the nation. <clears throat> to sustain this system, PSPA members support management that ensures fisheries harvests are sustainable. This is the purpose of the MSA and has been remarkably effective. The mandate to utilize the best available science ensures that decisions are based on facts and evidence which drives performance. Overall, the MSA is achieving its goal in the North Pacific and is not in need of reform. Of course, we recognize there are ways to further update improve or streamline the act. We also recognize there are regional differences that must be addressed and potential benefits of increased flexibility in some circumstances. But any changes should preserve and only build upon what already works in the act. At, as PSPA reviews and considers any changes to the act, we are guided by the following principles and find that any changes should ensure the following. First, preservation and enhancement of stock assessments and surveys must be maintained or expanded. This serves as the basis for all fishery management plans. This requires the cooperation from congressional appropriators, and we find it absolutely necessary for realizing optimum yield in all fisheries and responding to changes in stocks in the environment. New mandates included in any reauthorization should not come at the expense of reduced funding for fundamental stock assessments and survey responsibilities. Second, data utilized in stock assessments and surveys can and should come from many different sources, but they must continue to meet the high scientific standards demanded in any rigorous peer-reviewed process. The Act, which already requires the use of best available science, should not allow lower quality data to receive the same use in management because doing so would have the effect of increasing sources of error and uncertainty. Third, flexibility 
is necessary for councils to address the unique and changing circumstances that arise between stocks, sectors, economies, environments, fishing communities, and other regional needs. Managers benefit from having more tools in the toolbox and flexible, adaptable options for implementing them. The North Pacific has several examples of cooperative management programs that have benefited from flexibility, allowing for higher utilization, increased value, lower bycatch, reduced environmental impacts, and more responsive monitoring and management, largely driven by fishery participants in response to council objectives. Sustainable fisheries should achieve optimum yield through flexible and adaptable performance-based management, not prescriptive regulation. Fourth, any rigid mandates directing how management must be conducted should target species or sp specific needs without setting broader precedent. Congress should avoid across-the-board mandates in order to solve a specific problem in one region. Fifth, management systems and regulatory processes should be streamlined to the greatest extent possible. Unnecessary duplication of analyses or extra administrative steps that do not add value should be minimized. Sixth, council management systems should be transparent and promote accountability, reasonable pub public access to and fair representation by participants that operate in fisheries regulated by the council is vital for achieving more effective outcomes. Finally, we find that any changes to MSA should not erode the core tent of ensuring sustainable harvests. Alaska's fisheries are certified as sustainable through various international benchmarking programs due in large part to the governance systems at state and national levels. All U.S. fisheries that have achieved the goal of sustainability must not backtrack because doing so would not only affect thousands of fishery-dependent businesses, but it would harm consumer confidence that is increasingly important to seafood buyers around the world. In closing, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share our input with you. I applaud your efforts to ensure that the MSA remains the bedrock of sustainable fisheries management, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank Reed. You. Mr. Special. Um, good afternoon, and thank you so much for allowing us to talk today. We really appreciate the opportunity to share our insights. Uh, again, my name is Ben Special. I am the president of Yamaha Marine Group. My 1,000 team members are responsible for the outboard motor business, as well as five marine manufacturing facilities in the United States. We provide products and services to 120 independent boat companies and 2,000 independent retail dealerships, 19 of which are here in the uh, state of Alaska. I personally have been in this industry all my life. We bring a unique perspective to fishery conservation as our products are used in commercial, charter, as well as recreational fishing. Conservation is a key part of our mission as a company. It is also a true passion for us in the marine industry. We support and are active members in the American Sport Fishing Association, the Coastal Conservation Association, the Recreational Fishing Alliance, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, as well as the Kenai River Sport Fishing Association uh, here in Alaska. Mr. Chairman, Yamaha and our customers continue to advocate for the bill that you and Senator uh, Cory Brooker introduced, a Save Our Seas Act. We support these and other initiatives because we want a lot of fish in the ocean and we want to ensure healthy fish stocks for future generations of anglers and our children. Today, I would like to focus on the economic impact of the recreational saltwater fishing underscoring the need to amend Magnuson-Stevens Act. According to the data provided by the National Marine Fisheries, in 2015, over 9 million saltwater recreational anglers took over 60 million fishing trips, spending over $28 billion. These activities directly support 439,000 jobs and contribute $36 billion to the U.S. GDP. While impressive, these numbers don't begin to tell the complete story of the marine recreational saltwater economy and its national impact. It's not just coastal. It touches all 50 states. I'm going to give two examples. One, we operate a foundry in Indianapolis, Indiana, where we have 130 Yamaha employees producing 60,000 stainless steel propellers per year, most of which are used in saltwater fishing boats. The wax is used in the investment casting process is supplied out of Cleveland, Ohio. The stainless steel is supplied out of Oil City, Pennsylvania. The minerals used in our alloys are mined in places like Climax, Colorado, or Eagle Mine in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. At our Skeeter Boat Factory in Kilgore, Texas, we have 280 Yamaha employees manufacturing fishing boats many of which are used in the Gulf of Mexico by recreational anglers for red snapper and other saltwater species. The gel coats that we use in our resins come out of Kansas City, Missouri. The fuel tanks and live wells that are used in our boats come out of Sparta, Tennessee. The aluminum components used in the boat comes from Lake Zurich, Illinois, 
and the electronic components come out of Arkansas. The materials and subcomponents used in saltwater recreational fishing boats come from all over our great nation. This is another reason why it is so important we properly amend MSA so it takes into account the full economic impact of the saltwater recreational fishing economy. The recreational and commercial fishing are simply two fundamentally different activities needing distinctively different management tools. The original MSA law was enacted to govern commercial fishing sectors. It has done well there. However, the current one-size-fits-all approach has led to many problems for saltwater anglers that are unnecessarily burdensome, huge restrictions, and reduced economic output for our industry. Simply stated, you don't buy a fishing boat and tackle if you can't go fishing. The management strategies are in desperate need of an update. Critical improvements in MSA are included in the Senate Bill 1520. The Modern Fish Act will allow federal fisheries managers to use alternative management approaches for recreational fishing, similar to the state-based models that simply much better align with the nature of recreational fishing. We, all of us, are responsible for protecting the livelihoods of those who depend upon the recreational saltwater fishing economy. Our laws should be written for the good of the nation, not necessarily the good of one single industry. I hope I have shown that recreational fishing supports a large number of jobs, a variety a number of industries, and states. I want to thank you again for the opportunity today, and I really look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you. Ms. Benkin. Good afternoon, Chairman Sullivan. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Linda Benkin. I fish commercially on a 38-foot boat with my family out of Sitka. I'm president of the Halibut Coalition, which includes 13 member groups and over 400 individuals who provide halibut to U.S. consumers. I'm also the executive director of Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association and re represent both groups with my comments today. Before addressing specific issues, I would state overall that in Alaska and other regions around the country, from our perspective, the act is working. I would ask that any changes be guided by a firm commitment to conservation. While today I'll focus on strengthening the act to better support coastal fishermen and fishing communities, we believe this goal can only be achieved by maintaining strong conservation requirements across all sectors. By way of an example, in Alaska, we spent 15 years grappling with the conflicts between a rapidly increasing guided sport halibut harvest and a rapidly declining halibut resource. After Alaska's commercial halibut fishermen took up to a 76% reduction in their individual quotas, the courts ruled in favor of shared conservation and annual catch limits for both sectors. Halibut stocks are now rebuilding to the benefit of all. On a national level, rebuilding requirements have contributed to restoring 40 overfish stocks, which increased the value of commercially landed seafood by 18%, benefiting not only in fish and fishermen, but also the larger seafood economy, chefs, restaurants, retailers, and consumers. We are on the right course, but 38 important fish populations remain at unhealthy levels. We respectfully ask that the committee uphold MSA mandates and hold all sectors accountable for their catch. Even as we recognize these successes and recommit to healthy fisheries, our coalition believes more must be done to address the challenges faced by coastal fishermen, especially young fishermen. In Alaska, as elsewhere, commercial fisheries are a critical and sustainable source of employment, income, and cultural identity. Commercial fishing uniquely allows self-sufficient people, businesses, and communities to flourish in places where other economic opportunity is scarce. Losing access means losing a way of life and ultimately losing community. Young fishermen today face staggering entry-level costs and a level of risk that's equivalent to buying a starter hotel instead of a starter house as your first step in home ownership. These costs, with the nationwide, along with the nationwide focus on reducing the size of fishing fleets, has created a crisis in rural fishing communities. In Alaska, the problem is now not too few fishermen is now too few fishermen, not too few fish. We've found that the conservation and management benefits commonly attributed to limited access can be achieved with limited consolidation of fishing fleets, and that more fishermen making a living is better for our communities. In addressing the LAP provisions of the Act, we ask that the, you and the committee focus on supporting rather than reducing fleet size. 
Promoting and sustaining the access of community-based fishermen also demands regulations be designed to work for small boats. At-sea catch monitoring provides a prime example. Small boats do not have room to accommodate an observer, but they can fit electronic monitoring devices which capture the data needed for fisheries management. In Alaska, we now have an EL alternative for small boats, hence coastal fishermen can comply with at-sea monitoring requirements. To assist other areas, we've provided recommendations in our written comment, but I would highlight here the importance of developing programs at the regional level within full engagement of stakeholders to ensure that programs are fleet compatible, cost effective, and designed to be management objectives specific to that fishery. To summarize, the MSA created a successful management structure for our nation's fisheries. We believe the effective and comprehensive application of MSA requirements across all sectors is essential, and we ask the committee to recommit to these long-term conservation goals. We also ask that the committee address the significant challenges faced by young fishermen and the growing impact to rural communities of lost fishing access. Our communities need relatively large fleets that provide jobs, revenue, and long-term viability. Young fishermen need affordab affordable entry-level opportunities and a regulatory system that accommodates the scale of their operations. We, are, we urge the, you and the committee to help our communities realize the promise of National Standard 8, not by compromising resource health, but by providing coastal residents with sustained access to local communities. I wanted to thank you for testifying and also to recognize your leadership in introducing the Young Fishermen's De Development Act and to thank you for that. Okay, sure, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Ms. Ms. Benkin, for your testimony and um, agree 100% with the uh, next generation idea that you're talking about for our fishermen, not only in Alaska, but throughout the country. Uh, Mr. Alstrom. Senator uh, Sullivan, my name is Regner Alstrom. I'm the executive director of the Yukon Delta Fisheries Development Association, a community, a community development quota group. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to testify today. Since its inception, the community development quota program has been successful in delivering benefits and economic devel development to its communities. And that's whether those communities are in, are in ATCA with ATCA Pride Seafoods, providing a market and, uh, and a, a viable economy through those village, to that village, or whether it's in the village, one of my villages, Imanuk, which provides a, uh, a market for 500 salmon fishermen and 500 uh, 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 employees. Um, the, uh, the, the program is, is widespread uh, across Western Alaska with, with varying conditions. And, and those, the, I think the, um, uh, the benefit of the of the CEQ program has been it's been successful in bringing those be, those benefits offshore onshore. In Western Alaska, as you know, Senator, um, the um, uh, a lot of the, the the projects in Western Alaska have to be subsidized. And maybe subsidized is not the right word. They have uh, the the return on investment isn't as great as as what 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 we look to offshore. Um, and for, for um, if it wasn't for the, um, the, the program, and I'll speak to the Yukon Delta, there would be nothing there. I mean, it, it's, it's scary. Um, not, not to denigrate or say anything bad about the, uh, the regional native corporations or the village corporations or the non-governmental um, uh, non-profits there. The, the only thing that's been working is the CDU program. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's in Norton Sound or if it's in Yukon Delta or if it's in Bristol Bay. What has been working for the average person on the street is this program. It, uh, I'm, I can ramble for more than uh, five minutes on this. It's, when I see a young person, um, they actually get taller because we provide them training, a job, uh, um, or other benefits there, it's, 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 I, 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 can, I can go on forever. We have, uh, there's dire needs out there. We have um, a, a very young population out there in, in any one of those regions. Um, uh, high poverty rates, uh, social problems leading to suicides. We had uh, 
young lady, two young ladies in the last six weeks in Mount Village, 19 and 23 commit suicide. Another guy, in, uh, young, young man in Lucknock, my village, that committed uh, suicide. Alco alcoholism rates are high. Um, but when you provide training and you provide jobs, which the CDQ program does, it, you, it, you know, we're not addressing all the problems, but it's the pro program that's working the best. Um, how is how is how is the Magnuson Stevens Act working for us? I think one thing the uh, the groups can um, agree on is we'd like to see in the overall program we'd like to see stability. Now and that's not to say there are problems out there. There are uh, some CDQ groups that would like to re revisit allocations. Some of them would like to re revisit allocations based on population, or another group might want to revisit allocations based on uh, proximity to the resource. Or we can, Yukon Delta, we can hang our hat on, we'd like to revisit allocations be based on poverty. I think I'm the only one in here that uh, we have infrastructure needs in our villages. I'm the only one in here that uses a honey bucket, for instance. And I know we got good federal money <laughs> coming for that, but uh, that's just an example. Um, but getting back to the, to the, to the reallocation issue, um, when, when allocations were set, there was 20 criteria. And, and to go through and pick one or the other, um, maybe it's time, it's been 25 years since the program started, maybe it's time to do that. But maybe the forum is, 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 not, is not here. Uh, maybe the forum is at, at the Western Alaska Community Devel Development Association within that CDQ panel group. There may never be a um, agreement on reallocations. Uh, you pull from one, you have to take from someone else. And uh, so that's extremely controversial. Um, I, I can go on. I see my time's up. Thank you, Senator. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Ostrom. Mr. Stevens. Ah, there you go. Senator Sullivan, thank you very kindly for the opportunity. My name is Ben Stevens. I am from Stevens Village, Alaska. Stevens Village is north of Fairbanks on the Yukon River. Uh, I, I serve the people of the interior as the director of the Hunting and Fishing Task Force at Tanana Chiefs. Um, we represent some 37 villages, tribes, um, that also include a little over 40 communities. I also serve on the advisory panel to the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. Um, so I'd, I am what's considered uh, a tribal subsistence fisher person, fisherman. Um, essentially the way that I see that is just a guy that takes the fish out of the water and puts it on the table for his family. So I'm a little different in terms of uh, what I think the council and, uh, is used to. I am here to talk about that perspective being reflected in the new Magnuson Stevens Act. Last month, we, we had the privilege, I call it a privilege, to take our family, some tribal members, out to our family fish camp. In fact, I think I ran into you at the Yukon River Bridge. You were going down river to your camp, I was going up river to mine. And, um, and we saw a whole new picture of the people. Some of the tribal members we took, like you can probably relate to, are just in a rough way, in a very rough way. And the way that we interact on the land, on the river, is something that gives people hope. And that's what we saw, what I saw out there, as I, it's normal for me, but... Um, but it goes beyond that. Our kids are, are learning that fish camp culture. They're, they're learning the traditions. I had uh, one kid move from the gutton station to the filleting table. Another kid moved from that filleting table over to the cutting table that, where we do the salmon strips. These kids are growing. They're 12, 13 years old and they're packing rifles and they're protecting the camp. So I'm seeing so much good and I hear you. 
We're seeing so much good to that. Some guy I pulled off the street in, in Fairbanks. He sat on the bank and enjoyed the, the peace and the safety of the camp. So far from the hazards of being homeless on the streets of Fairbanks. There's so many more benefits that, uh, that I, can, I can expound upon. <clears throat> but I only have a few seconds here. Uh, we were lucky this year because our family was able to fully participate in the process of harvesting and cutting the fish and drying it. Uh, since, I mean, the past decade, we've, we've had problems. <clears throat> Five families were at our fish camp. They, in turn, took their share, went back to their extended families, and it just multiplied the, the love of the fish camp, the subsistence fish camp. I believe that this is a sector itself, and I don't think that this sector is adequately represented in Magnuson Stevens Act. And what I'm thinking is that I, I truly believe that fisheries management could benefit from the indigenous perspective. First, we have generations of knowledge about the land and the animals. That goes in tentacles beyond our understanding it's just a matter of us trying to figure out a way to fit that with Western science. Second, we do have a, a stake in the fisheries. Salmon is a staple of our people, constituting the majority of the subsistence harvest of fish annually. According to the Federal Subsistence Management Program, <clears throat> the state's rural residents harvest about 18,000 tons of wild foods a year it's a little under 300 pounds per person. 56% of that is, is fish. Nowhere else in the United States is there such a heavy reliance upon wild foods. That is putting your hand on the fire. That's one of the reasons why I think that we may be underrepresented. <clears throat> and uh, my final point is that, uh, that fish goes far beyond feeding us, far beyond sustenance. I think it touches our wellness as Alaska Native people because it does get us around that disenfranchisement with the land and the animals. Um, with that, sir, I, I thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Stevens, and it was, uh, it was good to see you on the Yukon, and it's an amazing place, as we all know. Um, let me just uh, offer up kind of what I did to the first panel, a very simple but basic but important question for the purposes of this hearing. And many of you have already touched on it in your testimony, but what would you hope to see in the MSA reauthorization and you know, what, are the, what are the key issues from your perspective? And I'll just open that up to all the panelists. Thank you, Senator. Um, when we look at it, we think we need recreational fishing uh, needs identified within the MSA law. Uh, just so it's specific and getting into and it. Mr. Spesso, you talked about needs. You also talked a lot about data, and that was one of the questions I was going to yeah. ask you uh, in particular, so maybe I'll just do it now. Are the needs mostly based on what you consider as a challenge, which is the lack of data as it relates to sports fishing and I, that I, management aspect? Obviously, one part of what we'd like to see, that's the third item we'd say we need to have, is a more robust data system. Uh, I love coming up to Alaska because you guys seem to know everything about the data. But I think in the parts of Is that of the true, Commissioner? <laughs> You're way better off. <laughs> I struggle with a few areas of that part of it. The, but I think it needs a more robust system of data collection or at least reasonable management approaches because sometimes this concept of the best available data is not really good. Yeah. Uh, many times in business you see that happen in you can overstudy the things and they come up with the data as opposed to having real information. Uh, we'd like to see a fair, fair allocation methodology uh, based off the economic output. Uh, the rec recreational fishing industry is a big, big industry. Uh, it's good for the economy of the United States. Uh, that doesn't take away from any other 
the industries in it just needs to be identified because it is so different uh, and I like the word that uh, the gentleman down here used about stability we need consistency a guy that buys a boat wants to go fishing he doesn't want to know one year he's going to have a three-day season and next year he's going to have a 22-day season and it's not going to be around the following he wants to see some consistency in it so I, I think that's the type of stuff we want to see is just identifying that recreational fishing is serious allow alternative management structures, allow for better data collection, use more modern tools. We all have smartphones today, a fair allocation based off economics, and avoid the peaks and valleys. Great. Others? Ms. Benton. Thank you for that question, Senator. Uh, I, first off, our perspective is the most important part of reauthorization has to be to maintain the strong conservation underpinnings of the act. Yeah. Nobody wins if the fish lose, whether you're a recreational fisherman, a subsistence fisherman, or a commercial fisherman. So that yes. above all, and that as we talk about flexibility or alternative tools, that that's not code or modern fishing act. There's nothing modern about overfishing. An right. alternative should not mean overfishing. Um, I guess I would just point out that the the average length in rebuilding plans right now is 20 years. There has been quite a flex bit of flexibility allowed to make those plans specific to the fish in question. So in looking at that, act, that aspect of the act, I would certainly caution against allowing flexibility to compromise conservation. Um, I think next for us relative to maintaining um, a great fisheries management system is adequate stock assessment, stock assessment that's well-funded, monitoring of all fisheries, all sectors, so that we know what's coming out of the resource, doing that in a way that flit, fits the fleets that are being managed. Um, there are certainly tools, smartphones, that weren't around when we designed existing monitoring mm -hmm. systems that can be used with far less burden to the users. So we are seeing, as I think Mr. Cotton mentioned a real need up here for additional funding for our observer program for electronic monitoring as we get that program back to where it needs to be um, in terms of coverage levels so those are very important pieces to me of this reauthorization process um, i guess the last piece of that i would mention would be the need for stronger socioeconomic data collection yeah. Um, that really gets at this issue of dependency in small communities on the resource, whether you're a subsistence fisherman, a commercial fisherman, a CDQ fisherman, in those communities, I don't feel like we're capturing that. And as a result, decisions are far too often driven by straight economics. Um, and that very important sort of culture and social dependence on the resource is, n is not driving decisions to the extent it needs to be to keep our communities and those jobs in those communities healthy and viable. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Senator. I, I, I'm gonna also talk about stock assessments and surveys and echo a few people before me. But I think that um, in, in my career in, in seafood and in most peoples from Alaska, wherever you go, you hear about how well-managed Alaska's fisheries are. Sometimes it seems like we might be talking to ourselves and, the, and it's bouncing back, but I think for the most part it's everyone else we're talking to as well. And the reason for that is that we have strong scientific data yeah. and, and backup. And I think that um, the job of, of the agency is to manage fisheries. And there are lots of other things that you can do with the money that you have available to you, but none of, nothing is more important than stock assessments and surveys. And historically we've had situations where Sometimes a, a politician steps in and is prescriptive in what, where money should be spent when not enough money is going to areas like stock assessments and surveys. And uh, we're supportive of that. We're supportive enough of those issues to stand up conservation and to stand up our fisheries and to make sure that the fish come first, that that's a good idea in our mind, I, I believe. I think um, I would, I would agree that in, and relative to rebuilding plans, there could be more flexibility than just the 10-year plan. There, there needs to be more flexibility in rebuilding mm -hmm. plans in general. Um, but I think uh, that in adding flexibility in, in with rebuilding, you still have to put the health of the resource first. And if there comes a time or comes years when fishing is curtailed or reduced, regardless of the user group, still put the fish first. and and suck it up and 
and take the hit. So you have a resource in the future for yep. those fishermen and their children. Mr. Alston. Thank you, Senator. Um, what we'd like to see in the reauthorization of uh, is reiterate stability within the CTQ program. We'd like to see um, the, um, uh, the hardened performance caps in the Pollock fishery seems to be working, but we'd like to see a periodic review in the Yukon River's rebuilding as far as Chinook returns, but uh, there seems to be a problem on the Cusco Quim. Um, and, and ditto with the halibut bycatch limits. Um, you know, we're hearing from villages um, along the coast that uh, halibut seem to be moving offshore because of maybe warming waters or other factors. And uh, we'd, we'd hate to see those, those the halibut bycatch uh, increase. It needs to be continually monitored. Um, we'd like to see uh, the pollock and crab stock assessments continue at a robust level. Uh, we'd, we'd hate to see the, those uh, testing mechanisms um, uh, reduced. Um, uh, the, uh, specific to the, uh, the uh, CDQ program, um, we, stability would also include uh, keeping that program as is. The, the program was uh, envisioned and, and, and written up to uh, include only those villages within 50 nautical miles that were reliant on the Bering Sea. Sometimes when you have a good program, you want to expand it, and then what you have is a weakened program yeah. for everyone. We'd like to see uh, that program as is. And uh, one last final note is that we'd uh, like to see the Western Alaska Community Development Association reinvigorated so it can, and I think, do what Senator Stevens in Visnet would do, uh, oversee the CDQ program. And, uh, Great. and th through your, um, the CDQ implement implementation committee that uh, was, I, I believe you directed, uh, uh, I think that's where we'll take yeah. in addressing that issue. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Stevens, any uh, thoughts just on the overview question, priorities, and um, what, what you see as uh, your, your priorities on MSA reauthorization? Uh, thanks, Senator. I think it's imperative that we include increased tribal representation. When, when I first got to the North Pacific uh, Council room, I realized right off the bat that there was, it was very thin in terms of, of tribal DNA. There's very, very little. I say that with all due respect to the hardworking folks that, that run the operation. Yeah, but it is what it is, and that is what I think that uh, we would like to see that and continued vigilance in terms of um, balancing sustainability and, and, and the needs of the world. Uh, and of course, continued vigilance surrounding bycatch. Good, thank you. Let me get a little more specific. Um, Mr. Reed, you, you know, you were listening to the last panel. There was a lot of discussion on data. As a matter of fact, everybody is, I think we're seeing one area of consensus, data, sustainability, very, very focused on uh, accurate stock assessments this is critical, no matter what user group you're looking at. Let me ask you kind of more specifically, you talked about, and in your, your written testimony, you talked about um, provisions related to the transparency and use of data. Um, included in any MSA reauthorization. There's also, I think, opportunities, but I, I, I'd like your, any other views, uh, any other of the witnesses views, to look at cooperative research programs that utilize state or university or other data. So, you know, the feds aren't the sole repositories of wisdom on the data, but how do we, how do we, kind of integrate with other data, make it transparent, but also make sure it's reliable, right? So it's got to be good data and good science. But to look at opportunities to expand it, right? There's tremendous research institutions that aren't the federal government. So what's the balance there? What would you like to see? And if anyone else has a view on that, I think we are seeing consensus on one issue, data, funding, which I fully support, but also, you know, can we cast a broader net on better data that can help us all that's not just driven 
purely by no one nymphs. Thank you, Senator. I, I, what I was trying to get at with my comments on that point, which I think is a very important point, is that there be transparency in uh, the robustness of the data that you're using. So that's federal government transparency, or if an agency, state or federal, is making a decision based on data, you want to know uh, what, what, what that data was. Is that what you mean by transparency? It is exactly. And I, I want to know, if it, is it a peer-reviewed uh, data set? Is it, a, is it gray literature from an, an interest group? Is it, um, uh, I, think, I think that traditionally and historically we look at who funded a study and, and make conclusions without ever reading the study a lot of times. Yeah. And I think that's unfortunate, but I think it's true. And I think if it's a peer-reviewed study as, compose, as opposed to non-peer-reviewed or, or gray literature, that makes a difference. And all of those things should be right out in the open, regardless of whether it's the government promoting the use of that data to back up yeah. their program, or whether it's someone from an industry, inter interested sector coming forth and testifying and saying, here's what you should do, and here's the data that I'm using to back it up. I think we need to know um, as much as we can about that when we're using it, and I think we need to stratify the value of that in a, in a consistent way. And do you think the current law or regs uh, don't emphasize that transparency enough? I think the current law em uh, uh, emphasizes that I understand there's some initiatives and some interest in changing that a little bit and, and maybe putting more um, value and less transparency on using data that isn't peer-reviewed necessarily or that is coming from sources that aren't ne necessarily required to be revealed. And I think that what we should do is the opposite of that. We should re just require the revelation of where it's coming from, how it was gathered, what the process was, and then we can fit it into the, the strata of, val of validity or robustness at the very least. Let me ask a related question for Mr. Special. Do you, do you, how do you think that Congress can help improve um, angler harvest data? Which I know is an issue that you've raised. We think there's an issue with the data because I see the output of the decisions and I hear the comments. I'm not an expert on the legislative policy and regulatory processes that's involved with that, but we see the, the uh, very poor output of the information or very weak information being used to make decisions. Uh, this concept of best available data may be allowing the standard deviation or the error factor to be way, way too large and they're making decisions on it. Those decisions directly affect people who go boating and enjoy the livelihoods of their work, and we need to get that robustly, more robustly built and up. And do you think, uh, from a, particularly the recreational industry side, that that is an issue um, that depends on the state? Is that something where the data is more state-driven, or it's a combination, um, again, I think, we, we believe that the data here is not perfect, but it's pretty strong. But um, is that kind of driven by different state approaches? I think your state agencies tend to do a better job at it from, than from the federal level. What we see through the state agencies, they tend to manage the information better because they're directly communicating with the angler. That's actually the, the challenge you have with wreck fishing is there's millions and millions of people and it's ones and twos and threes and fours versus commercial where you can measure it and really track it at a much higher level, which is wonderful. And there's so many assumptions in the process that we come up with these crazy policies that pop out that limit fishing and you go, I'm like, dudes, they're really there, they're everywhere, you can see them. <laughs> okay, any other uh, uh, witnesses want to comment on just the issue of data sufficiency and uh, collection opportunities? If I could just briefly, Senator, I would, I think, refer back to um, Chairman Dan Hull's comment about the SSC has to remain the screen for data. Um, as Mr. Reed pointed out, we need to know how that data, with the sources of that data, yeah. and how appropriate the data is, and ultimately, the SSC is qualified to review the information and to feed that information into the management process as being data to be trusted or data that's possibly not up to the usual standards for our management system. Great. Anyone else? Mr. Ross. Thank you, Senator. Uh, you know, as far as data and data collection, 
it starts with data clicks, and, and I'll just give you an example, and this is probably true of all the groups. Uh, UConn Delta, we're, 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 we're fully funding a NOAA study on salmon outmig outmigration, the smolt outmigration at the mouth of the Yukon. I mean, it's a quarter million dollars there summer year four. Um, and in the past, we've worked with ADF and Z and others to personally fund it, but this year it's fully funded. And then on the state level, with state cutbacks, we're, we, we spent another quarter million on, on uh, test net for, for, for the uh, summer and fall management uh, strategy. So, and it's not only Yukon Delta in this raw gathering of data. It's, it's Norton Sound is the same thing. I'm sure coastal villages, you start digging into it. So it, as, as federal and state monies get cut back for one reason or another, they're looking for groups to, to, to step in. And a lot of times that the groups that do step in are, are the CDQ groups. Yeah. Thanks. Any other, Mr. Stevens, any thoughts on that? Or? Just briefly, uh, we too are, are very interested in, in solid data. Um, and uh, may not pertain to exactly what we're talking about here, but um, we're trying to make sure that uh, the information that uh, the regulatory agencies are, are using to make these huge decisions, are, uh, they're using good, solid data. And uh, down those lines, we're trying to work with uh, the, the Yukon River Fish Commission to make sure that we're collecting good, solid data from each community along the river when it comes to, like, the Chinook salmon. So, um, so the, the agencies can have uh, the best possible data that, uh, that we could give them being on the ground. So, yeah, yeah we, we, do, we do agree that data is critical, especially when it has such huge implications to uh, big decisions. Let me ask a, 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 f a question, uh, Ms. Benkin, on your, your issue. It's an issue that I've been very focused on on the issue of electronic monitoring. Did, uh, I'm assuming you saw the NOAA published regs to integrate uh, the electronic monitoring into the North Pacific Observer Program that came out um, actually just this month. And um, it might be, I'm not sure if you've reviewed them, but I know you care about this issue a lot. Are you uh, satisfied with those regs? Are you thinking that's uh, a step in the right direction, and is that something we need to take on? Uh, we've been pressing the agencies to do a much better and faster uh, approach to that, as you've been advocating for, given some of our challenges here. What's your sense of the progress and satisfaction with that, particularly given that NOAA just uh, promulgated new regs on it? Thank you, Senator. We, we are um, really pleased to see the progress in the North Pacific. It has been um, a long process to get to this point of really having an EM alternative for small boats and a, a place we probably wouldn't be without support from our delegation um, and also the supplemental grant funding yep. from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, and I think I would just emphasize that uh, we aren't quite there. Um, yeah. This startup phase with electronic monitoring is the most expensive part of getting EM out there. It's when the equipment needs to be purchased, it needs to be um, installed on boats, and we really do need supplemental funding as we move to the point where it's fully funded by yeah. the fleet. Um, if you look at the numbers, and you amortize the cost of that equipment over the five years that will be its lifespan, EM is functioning at a about half the cost of an observer, um, but the upfront costs are fairly significant. So it's certainly important to have supplemental funding during this time. I think the other um, aspects of getting EM out on the water that we've found to be particular crit particularly critical are involving stakeholders in development of the program initially, but also in, in guiding what the research and development is for the EM programs of the future yeah. and making sure that that future EM systems are compatible with the fleet that they're being designed for, um, that they are cost effective um, and not sort of a, you know, a grand scheme for what Star Wars EM might be at some point. So to have them be practical, to be fleet compatible. Um, then the last point I would make, 
Um, EM quickly becomes not cost effective if data storage requirements become excessive. Yeah. We've seen um, an interest from enforcement in being able to store that data for five years yeah. um, for the opportunity to maybe mine the data at some point in the future for enforcement purposes. Where EM is primarily uh, implemented for catch accounting purposes or support catch and by catch information, our view is that EM data storage needs to be one year. At the end of a year, you use that information to inform yep. your stock assessment process, but that to require storage much beyond that quickly makes a program that's very effective, cost effective, fleet compatible become unworkable. So we would look for some guidance from you on limiting yeah. that data storage requirement. Well, I appreciate the comment, and uh, uh, we certainly want to continue to work with you uh, and others on this. We think. And I think you know we've been pressing no on this for, gosh, uh, at least a couple of years. And um, we want to continue to work with everybody here on that issue as it's being implemented. But I think there's, there are some important advancements on that. So I, I appreciate that comment. Let me, um, let me turn, uh, Mr. Alstrom, I, I, I wanted to dig down a little bit on, on two issues that you raised one and then it came up in the previous panel and I know some ways you are impacted by it. So when you have the opportunity to mention it, are there any aspects, and I appreciated your uh, very constructive participation in that recent broader meeting we had with uh, different CDQ groups, which I thought went uh, quite well. But um, are there elements of the program, the CDQ program, that you think are in need of update or revision? And secondly, What's your view on the recusal issue, particularly because a lot of times that has seemed to kind of focus on CDQ-related council members, and I think, you know, that's a problem. Senator, I'll, I'll start with the easy one first. I, we support uh, Commissioner Cotton's remarks on, on the recusal issue. Um, we believe the, uh, I'll just read right from my written, we believe the regulatory structure is outdated, not evenly applied, and has recently prevented several voting members of the North Pacific Fishery Management Council from, from voting on important issues such as halibut bycatch. We ask that the Congress work with affected parties and NIMS to see if there are meaningful, meaningful changes to the recu recusal and conflict regulations that would protect the integrity of the council process while still allowing the input from Alaska that was intended by the MSA when creating the council system. Um, there needs to be a change. Yeah. Um, and uh, Senator, I, 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 if I remember your first question correctly, you wanted to know if there was a way in, in MS, MSA that we can, we the CDQ program can make it more more functional or more easy. I think, um, you know, within the CDQ panel, which at least Yukon Delta identifies as the Western Alaska Community De Development Association, the panel that was supposed to take over for, for the day-to-day -day, um, oversight from the state and from the federal oversight teams, I think there needs to be a change where, where um, that process does not not Items in that process don't don't need full unanimous support. I think a super majority of five out of six uh, of the CDQ would vote in, uh, groups voting to move a a um, uh, a rule forward. I think that would really help to make issues within the CDQ CDQ program that are controversial at least will move continue to move forward. Um, the program is so important. I, I just, I, I, I feel amiss that I'm not emphasizing how important it is to, to Western Alaska, yeah. this program. But I think, you know, think that would be the, a change we need. Let me ask uh, Mr. Stevens, you mentioned, and I appreciate your focus on the tribal and subsistence needs uh, and emphasis for our Alaska Native population. Have you thought about kind of looking at ways, because MSA obviously applies nationally, 
and um, a lot of the different councils uh, don't have such a large population and the issues that we have in the state uh, on those kind of issues, subsistence and otherwise. Have you thought about how, if we are looking at amending the act in ways that relate to those issues, you could do it in a way that recognizes that it's still a national law and in a lot of regions, the, those, are, those aren't the prominent issues that are being uh, raised. Well, I do believe that, uh, that it is of such significance that we can't turn away from it. As I mentioned, uh, the, the importance of subsistence is monumental to the Alaska Native people the rural Alaskans, considering the fact that we're basically the, the, the last in the nation to be so heavily reliant upon this, I, I believe begs uh, some consideration. Yeah, oh, yeah. And so, um, so. We, okay, oh, I appreciate that. Any other thoughts on that? Just kind of in, in terms of the, the, uh, way in which that would be more strongly strongly influenced in a reauthorization highlighted is there language or issues that you you have or can there, recommend us in in our written testimony we have an addendum to it with some language on it great thank you well let me let me ask i'll just open up any any final uh final comments from any of the panelists as we turn to our our third uh panel members any any last rounds uh, that you want to mention? Uh, I want to give everybody a chance to briefly, uh, I want to be respectful of our next panel, but to briefly uh, just emphasize any final issues. Mr. Reed. Thank you, Senator. I just wanted to, um, on the issue of ele electronic monitoring, the uh, closely associated issue of observer coverage, I'd like to uh, state some support for observer funding uh, in the North Pacific. Uh, we've paid our own way in the North Pacific in the, in the fisheries that are observed and have been observed for many years, and it would be nice to have some um, of that paid as in some areas of the country, 100% of it is being paid by the federal yeah, government. Yeah, so it's a bit, it's an important issue. I'm glad you raised that because it, it does seem uneven in different regions. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, we, we'd appreciate that. And on the electronic side, I think that, that the future has um, a good helping of electronic monitoring in all of our fisheries for cost reasons and, and for the data needs that we have. And so I think that some funding is maybe transitional in that regard. So we appreciate your consideration of that. And I would also like to thank you again for uh, having us here today and for right. holding the hearing. Thanks so much. Anyone else for uh, Mr. Alston? Senator, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to be at me, Mr. Not mentioning this. All the groups through this, I'll give you an example for you, Kantelte. We do reach out to the non-CDQ villages. In our plant mnemonic, we have workers, uh, about 100 of them from 18 vi non-CDQ villages, Upper Yukon, Upper Cusco, Quimpton, and north of us. So all the groups try to reach out outside of their regions to provide benefits. I didn't, I didn't want to imply this. We have, you don't. We are, yeah. we are reaching out. Thank you. Mr. Stevens. I'm good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Just Mr. real quickly, Professor. I'd like to say thank you so much, but we are very concerned about the next draft of MSA and how it goes through because we are watching what comes from the economic output of it. Of course, we want great conservation as a company. That's what we want. That's what our lifeblood is in this whole thing and the, the millions of communities that are affected by this. You have to keep that in awareness. We are not as large as what we were pre-recession and we think this has been a big driver that's kept our uh, middle market from coming back in the saltwater area. So we would really like to see some positive outcome as we've outlined. So I want to thank you so very much for this time again. Sure, absolutely. Ms. Benkin, you have the final word. I'll just close by saying thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I think it's been a really great discussion. Great, okay. Well, how about a round of applause for our second panel here? And we'll uh, ask the third and final panel to please come up to the dais. Thank you.
Okay, well, I want to begin our third and final panel. Thank you for being so patient. Again, we have a very uh, distinguished panel representing several different uh, stakeholder groups. We want to hear from all of you on your views on this important topic. Um, the final panel of witnesses consists of Shan Carroll, who's the Deputy Director of the Alaska Marine Conservation Council, Julie Bonney, the Executive Director of the Alaska Groundfish Data Bank, Lori Swanson, Executive Director of Marine Conservation Alliance, Duncan Fields, the Gulf of Alaska Coastal Communities Coalition, and Liz Oglivy. Ogilvy. Ogilvy, thank you, Liz, uh, Chief Marketing Officer of the American Sport Fishing Association. So, uh, Mr. Carroll, why don't we begin with you? You have five minutes, and um, if you have a longer written statement, that will be included in the record of this uh, Senate hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll assume best for last for being put on panel three. Um, so yes, absolutely. Th thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Shannon Carroll. I'm a former commercial fisherman and deputy director of the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. Our mission is to promote healthy fisheries, um, fishing dependent communities through sustainable fishing practices and local stewardship. We're also a member of the Fishing Community Coalition, which is a national association of community-based and small boat commercial fishing groups. Collectively, we support the MSA and respectfully offer the following comments on reauthorization. Um, before I do so, however, I want to thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for hearing from stakeholders at the outset of reauthorization. I think stakeholders are essential to the fisheries management process, and I appreciate the committee for acknowledging that fact. And I also want to thank you for your leadership on fisheries and ocean issues. Uh, in particular, with, we greatly appreciate your support and introduction of the Young Fishermen's Development Act. Um, AMCC urges the committee to take a do-no-harm approach to reauthorization. We continue to believe that uh, many of the issues plaguing various fisheries across the country could be addressed by, better invest in, by investing in better and or more frequent stock assessments, data, research, and accountability measures. Alaska has demonstrated that such measures are indeed the cornerstone of effective fisheries management. I think the numbers speak for themselves. North Pacific fishermen harvest between five and six billion pounds of seafood annually, supporting about 9,800 vessels, about 100 processing plants, and generating 14.6 billion in economic output. Recognizing the success, Congress amended the, the Magnuson Act to bring the Alaska model to the rest of the country. And of the 41 stocks that were listed as subject to overfishing at that time, only 14 remain in such condition. Today, we enjoy the lowest number of overfished stocks in history, while landing revenue is up 18 percent since 2005. We certainly recognize that uh, fisheries in other regions have struggled under these provisions. But before considering ways to weaken the act, we ask that the committee consider that in most cases, the root of the problem in these regions is poor data and poor accountability. Adding additional flexibility to annual catch limits may increase those limits in the short term, but it does not address the underlying issues in those fisheries and is therefore not a viable long-term solution. Rather than lower the bar, we urge the committee to consider changes that raise the bar for all fisheries by strengthening the foundation upon which sustainable fisheries management rests. Accountability, timely and accurate data. Here in the North Pacific, as elsewhere, uh, that foundation is being threatened. Next year, for example, NOAA may be reducing the number of survey vessels in the Gulf and the Bering Sea, as well as the number of fishing vessels carrying observers due to declining or stagnant funding levels. Uh, this loss, among other things, will result in greater uncertainty in the data driving management decisions, potentially leading to more precautionary catch limits and less economic benefit from our fisheries. Uh, Congress can help fishermen, processors, coastal communities, and the thousands of small businesses that depend on wild-caught American seafood by investing in the science that allows fishermen to har harvest optimal yield on a continuing basis. Um, I also understand that the committee has heard a lot from recreational fishermen about how the MSA is not working for them based on the premise that recreational and commercial fishing are fundamentally different. While we may agree that they have different objectives, the end result of both sectors is really the same as the harvesting of a public resource. So I would urge this committee to ensure that sound science and individual accountability are the foundation of any new proposal. We don't believe that the Modernizing, Modernizing Recreational Fisheries Management Act accomplishes this goal. Uh, to provide sport fishermen with more fish, it allows fishery managers to use alternative management measures. Uh, but unfortunately, these measures ignore precautionary principles for data poor stocks. They stymie research and innovation by making um, experimental and exempted fishing permit process unworkable and undermine the 10-year stock rebuilding process. Lastly, I just want to touch on, um, I'd like to highlight some of the challenges facing the next generation of commercial fishermen. Uh, they face daunting challenges, including high cost of entry, limited entry opportunities, and declining opportunities um, for mentorship and training. 
In Alaska, these challenges are reflected in the declining number of young people entering the industry and the ongoing attrition of fishing rights from Alaska fishing communities. Not long ago, the agricultural industry faced similar challenges and worked with Congress to create the Beginning Farmers and Ranchers Development Program. Uh, the Young Fishermen's Development Act is modeled after the successful concept and aims, aims to create a national program exclusively dedicated to assisting, educating, and training the next generation of commercial fishermen. This bill would ensure America's fishing communities continue to thrive for future generations by supporting economic opportunity, jobs, and food security while preserving a proud heritage and a way of life. And we want to thank you again for introducing this bill, and I'm happy to have, answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bonnie. Senator Sullivan, thank you for the invitation to testify in the reauthorization of the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. My name is Julie Bonney, and I am testifying on behalf of the trawl catcher vessels and shore based processors who are members of Alaska Ground Fish Data Bank. For 40 years, the Magnuson Stevens Act has worked well for Alaska and for my hometown, Kodiak, America's second largest port by volume and third largest by value. The Act and its 10 national standards in their current form appropriately guide council decision making. We do not support any changes or any additions to the standards or any major changes to the Act. The entire U.S. fishing industry has benefited from the flexibility of the Act. <coughs> the North Pacific Management Council has solved many regional fishery management issues through its transparent, public, and science-based decision making process. The best and most creative solutions to management problems have typically come from particip fishery participants working with the council that understands and values the fisheries they regulate. Council makeup is therefore a key component of successful fishery management. Councils should include diverse representation with fisheries expertise and background, stakeholders from a spectrum of fishing communities, fishermen and processors affected by the fisheries regulated by the council should all be represented. It is easy to name examples of management programs developed under the act that benefit communities across Alaska. The community quota entity program and the allocation of fixed gear cod licenses were developed by representatives of small rural communities in the Gulf of Alaska. The highly successful Community Development Quota Program benefits coastal communities in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands. Regional del delivery requirements were developed to keep rockfish coming across the dock in Kodiak and crab coming across the docks in the Pribilof Islands. In Alaska, we have benefited from catch share programs in several of our fisheries. These programs have greatly improved fishery data helping our fishery fleets to self-fund over 50% of the nation's observer days. Alaska Groundfish Data Bank presently manages seven shore-based harvesting cooperatives in the central Gulf of Alaska rockfish fishery. That catch share program stopped the race for fish, brought community benefits to Kodiak, reduced bycatch, increased harvest efficiencies, and increased fishery monitoring. Our catch share history fishery has enjoyed 11 successful years. We agree with the Council Coordination Committee that a catch share management need <laughs> that catch share management needs to remain in the council's toolbox. Catch share programs are certainly not appropriate for every fishery, so the discretionary nature of the catch share management makes sense. A major theme of the August 1st MSA hearing was sustainably increasing wild harvest for our fisheries to provide greater benefits to the nation. My members believe that the fishing industry can achieve this goal. However, care needs to be taken to make sure that the flexibility is not used to erode conservation objectives. Flexibility to address rebuilding timelines for overfished stocks, to allow harvest of choke species that impede harvest of other fish stocks and relaxing management measures for data poor sharks are some of the concepts being promoted. NIMS revised the National Standard 1 guidelines just last year to provide tools to increase flexibility in rebuilding plans, better define ecosystem component species and faves and changes to catch limits. Whether these new flexibilities strike the right balance should be evaluated before amending the act. AGD mem AGDB members are well versed on the highly controversial, complicated, and polarizing topic of fishery bycatch. 
All fisheries have bycatch. It is unavoidable. Regulating bycatch is important for equity and conservation, but we need to distinguish actions that achieve conservation objectives from those that are largely allocated. Actions that provide little or no benefit to stocks or competing fisheries, but reduce net benefit to the nation, prevent achieving optimum meal, or increasing cost to the fishing fleet should be avoided. The 2006 reauthorization magnuson stevick Act was an endorsement of the Alaska model. Some small tweaks may be necessary for other regions <coughs> during this reauthorization process, but in general, it is working well in Alaska. Thank you for the opportunity to comment, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Bonney. Ms. Swan uh, Swanson. Attorney Sullivan. 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 Chairman Sullivan, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Magnuson Stevens Conservation and Management Act. My name is Lori Swanson. I'm the executive director of the Marine Conservation Alliance, also known as MCA. Our organization is comprised of harvesters, processors, and fishing-dependent coastal communities with interests in the Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands, and Gulf of Alaska. MCA is committed to supporting sound, science-based fisheries management in the North Pacific to promote sustainable fisheries and a healthy environment. I'm here to talk about how the current Magnuson-Stevens Act has supported these goals and allowed a sustainable annual harvest of over 2 million metric tons of seafood in the federal fisheries for decades. The MSA is built on 10 national standards which have inherent conflicts. This tension drives the balancing act that preserves the health of our fisheries and the environment that supports them. The hallmark of the MSA is the Regional Fisheries Management Council system, which recognizes that one size does not fit all and allows for solutions that are tailored to the specific problems encountered locally. MCA does not believe there are any systemic issues in the act that need to be addressed. It appears that most of the concerns that exist are regional in nature, so maintaining and expanding regional flexibility provides the best solution. For example, catch shares are very successful in the North Pacific, reducing bycatch, increasing monitoring levels, and allowing fine-scale catch management. The performance of these programs is reviewed regularly, and modifications are made as necessary through a public process informed by detailed analysis. While we recognize the success of catch share programs in the North Pacific, we also acknowledge that catch shares may not be suitable for fisheries in all, of the, all regions. Environmental concerns are also addressed at the regional level. The North Pacific Council has established numerous areas where fisheries or gear types are restricted or prohibited. These areas serve a variety of purposes, from protecting sensitive habitats to providing exclusive access to local fishery-dependent communities. The recent review of essential fish habitat in our region determined that the impact from fisheries on habitat is less than 2% region-wide. The North Pacific Council has been refining the practice of ecosystem-based fisheries management, or EBFM, since the first committee was formed in 1996. Annual stock assessments update ecosystem components and allowable biological catches incorporate ecosystem considerations. The Council developed a fishery ecosystem plan for the Aleutian Islands and is developing a similar plan for the Bering Sea. These plans require adequate data and a sound scientific base, are extremely time consuming, and are subject to numerous, numerous public and scientific reviews. Adding new mandates for FEPs may make the process untenable by putting management in front of science. We believe the development of FEPs, their content, should both remain discretionary. EBFM will continue to be a critical component of our fisheries management. I would also like to comment on the use of best available science in fishery management. Sound science is the bedrock of sustainable fisheries. There are times when what's presented as the best science available may be anecdotal, biased, or untested. It is very important to understand this information prior to using it. Any research from any source should be subject to intense scrutiny before being used in management decisions. And finally, while I recognize this hearing is not focused on scientific funding, I encourage you to maintain adequate funding for scientific research in the North Pacific. Our fisheries are supported by surveys which are conducted annually in many cases, but at least every third year, and annual stock assessments. It is impossible to overstate the importance of this work. Historic survey data provide a long-term view of the effects of years of warm and cold water, changes in the amount of ice cover, 
and other factors which help scientists understand and predict future challenges. With increased water temperatures, fish are moving between areas and depths, and current survey information is even more critical. Continued funding supports a decades-long database of oceanographic conditions in a region faced with climate change. Further, uncertainty requires more conservative catch limits and reduced harvest levels to ensure the stock is protected. Regular surveys provide increased certainty in the status of our stocks. In summary, the Magnuson-Stevens Act has worked well for over 40 years, and we believe that success must be recognized and protected. I encourage you to refrain from sweeping national changes and to maintain the flexibility for each region to develop and improve upon management programs tailored to their specific needs. Thank you for the opportunity to comment, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you for your testimony, and uh, you, you, you raised a good point, which is, um, although the hearing isn't focused on the issue of federal funding, I can tell you I'm hearing that issue loud and clear from all the panelists, so uh, thank you for emphasizing that, like others have. Uh, Mr. Fields, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Senator. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I've worked for about 30 years with the Gulf of Alaska, uh, smaller rural communities, kind of defined as communities of less than 1,500 people without road access. These are truly fishing communities. That's the only economy in the communities. I was picking fish Monday morning. Uh, we were doing good. Lots of fish in the nets, and I thought, why am I coming to this hearing? Oh, we were uh, running Yamaha two-stroke Enduros. They're great engines. <laughs> but, uh, why am I coming to this hearing? And, I, and I'm coming because I feel Magnuson has failed the smaller rural fishery dependent communities in Alaska. And this is a, despite the great national standard aid for providing for the sustained participation of the communities and to mitigate the economic harm to the communities, we see in the smaller communities in the Gulf of Alaska increased and continued separation from the federal fisheries. We saw that initially in, uh, you know, Post-1995, uh, uh, when the uh, halibut sablefish IFQ program came into effect, uh, by 2000, we'd already accumulated enough information, sociological and economic information, to see that halibut uh, quota share was migrating from rural communities. The council acted. Uh, they enacted something called the CQE program, or the Community Quota Entity Program. It provided opportunities for approximately 45 of these smaller, uh, isolated communities to buy halibut and sablefish quota shares. Of those 45 eligible communities, only three have been able to buy halibut shares and only a few shares at that. This program largely has been a failure, not because of um, anything the council uh, could have done, but because once quota share is issued, it's almost impossible for a rural community to catch up in terms of buying that quota share and paying the debt service based on the return uh, from fishing the quota share. So I think if we have anything to add to the discussion, uh, Senator, it's that at the outset of any kind of uh, limited access privilege program, if you're going to protect communities, particularly rural communities, those communities are going to be need, to need to be awarded quota. And I think we have the CDQ program in Western Alaska as an example uh, of that paradigm and the need uh, for the award quota. So when we go back to Magnuson-Stevens and we look at the community protection uh, provisions under the LAP program, we have two primary provisions. One is uh, communities develop a community sustainability plan. Uh, the second provision is regional fishing association. Both of those provisions, from our experience, are flawed so that they're not workable. In fact, the last 10 years, I'm not aware of any council anywhere in the, uh, in the country that has been able to use those provisions to protect those communities. So I think just very briefly, three aspects of those provisions that need to be revised. One is, is the burden needs to be on the council to show when they develop or initiate a LAP program how, how that program is going to provide for the sustained participation of that community and the economic protection of that community. So in the uh, purposes or in the uh, provisions of the LAP program, there's 11 provisions, there needs to also be something to say, something to effect of, and to the effect of how is this program going to protect communities. 
In addition to that, when you develop a uh, community sustainability plan, there is uh, council approved criteria, uh, uh, criteria that are supposed to be approved by the secretary, published in the Federal Register, that are available to the communities to develop their community stable, sustainable plan. I'm not aware of any council that has developed this criteria. There needs to be a mandate in this provision to say before you have a LAP program, the council will develop these communities, so or these criteria, so that the community in developing their community sustainability plan knows uh, the uh, matrix by which it's going to be judged. Then finally, there's a contingent liability built in to the current provision so that the secretary uh, may withhold or revoke uh, um, quota share uh, being fished by an individual that's owned by the community and, and may or may not give it back either to the individual, but it doesn't specify to the community. As I've talked to investors and NGOs that are interested in helping communities buy quota share, they say that's a, non, that, that's a, that's a showstopper. We, we can't invest in quota that can be revoked and may or may not come back to the community. So those are the three specific provisions that would help uh, in the uh, community protections. And then finally, in my last uh, 30 minutes, 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Chairman, the rural communities in the Gulf of Alaska are very concerned about the amount of discards that are continuing. We have, uh, you know, Magnuson Stevens National Standard 9. We want to reduce bycatch. We want to reduce mortality by bycatch. But we're still throwing away tens of millions of pounds of dead fish that could enter the stream of commerce. And that's a violation, in my judgment, of National Standard 1 of optimum yield. Mm. The Gulf of, or in Alaska, generally, we throw over uh, 10 million pounds of halibut annually. We throw that away. This is fundamentally in mm. conflict with the values of our rural communities. Why waste food? And so, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I have a number of other reasons, there's a matter of national policy. We need to focus on the redu reduction of discards. The European community, by the way, is, is light years ahead of the United States on this, and they have very strict guidelines or goals set for the reduction of regulatory and economic discards, Mr. Chairman. That concludes the testimony of the Gulf of Alaska Coastal Community Coast. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Fields. Ms. Ogilvie. Chairman Sullivan. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Magnuson-Stephen Fishery C Conservation and Management Act. As Chief Marketing Officer of the American Sport Fishing Association, I hope my perspective, as someone who is involved in a variety of national efforts focused on the future of recreational fishing, can be of value to the subcommittee, and as such, I will focus broadly on trends of the sport as a whole and how federal marine fisheries management fits in. The American Sport Fishing Association, or ASA, is the national trade association representing over 800 fishing tackle manufacturers, distributors, retailers, media, and other components of the industry who service the 47 million Americans who recreationally fish each year. We are involved in a wide variety of policy and legislative issues affecting the future of the sport, but devote a significant portion of our advocacy efforts on federal marine fisheries management. Considering that 82% of all fishing trips occur in freshwater, it may seem counterintuitive to focus so much attention on marine fisheries. However, the industry sees tremendous growth opportunities in the saltwater fishing market. The average cost of a saltwater trip is twice that of a freshwater trip. Offshore trips must be taken from a boat, and these boats tend to be larger, consume more fuel, and are outfitted with higher end gear. Substantial economic opportunities for our industry and associated industries exist with offshore recreational fishing, but we are confronted with a management system that for years has been limiting that opportunity. In contrast, ASA believes that freshwater fisheries management has largely been figured out. Both the state fish and wildlife agencies and the federal land management agencies have a symbiotic relationship with the recreational fishing community. They go above and beyond to communicate with anglers, solicit input, and work together to ensure anglers are satisfied with their experiences on the water. As a result, they are seen as partners in conservation and participation. Conversely, NOAA Fisheries is viewed by many in the recreational fishing community as an adversary. While efforts have been made in recent years to improve the dialogue between the agency and anglers, we have seen little change in the agency's actions and how they translate to fishing opportunities. Fairly or unfairly, the general perception among anglers is that NOAA Fisheries only understands and cares about commercial fishing. While overfishing is now at an all-time low, in many fisheries that has not translated into improved fishing access for recreational fishermen. This is believed to be a result of a management system that fails to recognize that commercial and recreational fishing are different activities. Without question, 
Commercial fishing is tremendously important to the nation by creating jobs and providing a sustainable supply of seafood across our country. My comments are not intended to diminish the importance of commercial fishing, but to recognize that the benefits of recreational fishing are also important and can no longer be an afterthought in the way our federal marine fisheries are managed. As a community comprised of thousands of businesses and the millions of customers they serve, we want modern management approaches, science, and technology to guide decision making. Since its original passage in 1976 and through subsequent reauthorizations, the Magnuson-Stevens Act has never focused specifically on addressing the unique challenges of federal saltwater recreational fisheries management. We hope Congress will use the current reauthorization process as an opportunity to address this historic inequity. And ASA believes passage of Senate Bill 1520, the Modernizing Recreational Fisheries Management Act, would be a tremendous step towards this goal. By recognizing recreational fishing as an important and distinct activity, Congress and NOAA Fisheries can go a long way toward creating an environment in which saltwater recreational fishing's many benefits to the nation are fully realized. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, and thank you, thank you again to all the uh, witnesses. I will begin with the same question I asked the other two panels, and I know you've highlighted it already in your uh, testimony, but just to get uh, you know, a strong statement for the record. What what do you hope to see in terms of your priorities with regard to any MSA reauthorization? And I'll just open that up to everybody while we begin with Mr. Fields. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Really, two things from the perspective of the uh, Gulf uh, Coastal communities. One is um, make the provisions under the LAMP, uh, Limited Access Privilege part of the Act, workable for communities. And, and they're not complex changes, not difficult changes, but make those provisions workable so that a community wanting to participate in a LAP program can develop a community sustainability plan, understand the rules relative to that plan, receive quota, and functionally uh, work with the quota they receive. Second aspect is look at the amount of regulatory and economic discards all across mm. the country. Recognize that times have changed. Look at what Europe's doing. and track the logical progression of to the extent practicable, and everything's qualified to the extent practical, reduce bycatch, reduce mortality from bycatch, and I would like to add, and if mortality and bycatch are not reduced, don't throw away dead fish. To the extent practicable, utilize what's otherwise discarded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you. Mr. Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, I think at the outset, and several times you noted that you're looking for consensus, and I, I think after you know hearing three panels, you, the consensus seems to really be that ways to improve data and accountability are, are the best ways forward. Um, so that's certainly something that AMCC would like to see and um, the, the Fishing Communities Coalition. And to that end, we've submitted an amendment package that we think addresses a lot of the accountability and, and data needs um, in the MSA. There's small, minor tweaks, but we think that they could go a long way forward to it towards furthering the, the objectives of the Magnus Act. And um, I'd also like to agree with Mr. Fields. We also submitted an amendment that's largely similar to, I think, what he's discussing under 303A, which is just streamlining and improving um, the lap provisions so that coastal communities understand uh, what is needed so that they can apply to receive allocations under the LAP program. Um, and finally, I, I do think, again, that there's an opportunity to address uh, through non-regulatory means, through the Young Fishermen's Development Act, some, some opportunities for next generation fishermen. And I think because the federal government does manage the fisheries as a public trust, that's a real obligation that they have to, to see forward. So thank you. Good. Great. Others? Thoughts? Ms. Swanson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I echo a lot of what other people have said, that the, the bones of the act are good. Don't change what's working already. And I don't want to repeat what everyone has already said. One specific issue that I would address is the use of the term overfishing and overfished. I think there should be a better way to express a stock that is depressed from fishing versus a stock that is depressed from an environmental yeah. or other factor and what the mandated response is in those situations. Or we have a, a blue king crab stock in the Pribilofs that is overfished, even though no fishing occurs on it and hasn't for years. It's unlikely to recover, but there are still mandated recovery plans. That type of, of uh, 
structure just, it doesn't make sense. I think it's misleading to the public as well. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bonney. Uh, just to follow on with, uh, I've got two things. One is the definition of overfishing and the, uh, uh, what, rebuilding plans based on a 10-year rebuilding. I do think that the 10-year rebuilding timeline is arbitrary. And so it, I think that there might be some room to look at um, additional flexibility without opening the barn door, so to speak. Yeah. Um, also, in terms of the issue that Lori just raised, which is the blue king crab stocks in the Pribble Offs, it's an environmental problem. And um, yet the only thing that the council can regulate is the, is the fishing activity. Mm. So we're restricting fishing, uh, creating a lot of economic, uh, what, uh, impact to the fishing fleet and there's going to be no net benefit for that stock so if there would be uh, some kind of way to c have maybe the SSC or the science community define a fish that's in that category that you wouldn't have to go through the um, rigorous rebuilding plan I think that would be beneficial right Ms. Ogilvie Yes, the, from the recreational fishing community's point of view, the, the two main tenets for uh, reauthorization of Magnus and Stevens really are the confidence, gaining back the confidence in that data collection, and then recognizing, again, that the recreational commercial and commercial fishing are different activities and should be managed so. Thank right. you. Let me uh, kind of dig down into a couple more specific questions related to some of the interests and expertise of the different panelists. Uh, Mr. Carroll, I, I know that you, you, your organization played an important role in the Alaska Young Fishermen's Network. Um, can you describe a brief description of the network and what you're trying to do in terms of the successes and how, you know, as we're looking at this legislation, as I mentioned in my opening statement, you know, the idea of making sure the next generation is able to take advantage, to thrive, to have opportunities, you know, is I think one of the most important things we could do. I'm very pleased you're on the panel to represent that kind of group, important interest group. Can you talk a little bit more to that, what you've done? Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, and I will point out there's a least one member of the Young Fishermen's Network in the audience today. Good. Um, so you know, we helped create the, the Young Fishermen's Network largely um, you know, for the same reasons that I discussed in my support for the Young Fishermen's Development Act. And, and that's that um, we, we certainly recognize that there are, are many barriers to entry for, mm -hmm. for next generation fishermen, for beginning fishermen. Um, and, and largely those are involving uh, access to capital and, and financial. But um, in speaking to a lot of our members and, and fishermen, we really recognize that there's also sort of uh, a networking and mentorship and education gap that, that's missing. And uh, in part that's due to the out-migration of permits and that loss of institutional knowledge in, in communities and that sort of feedback loop that you get. But um, but it, it was a major gap, and, and as a lot of fishermen now look to make half a million to a million dollar investments in their future, um, a, a lot of concerns revolved around not knowing how to you know, fix the refrigeration system on their boat yeah. and not knowing how to properly pay their taxes. Um, so we, to that end, we, we started the Young Fishermen's Network as a way to uh, informally improve networking and education among fishermen. And we've seen some really great success. And just one, one anecdotal story is I, one of my friends who's a member of the network was out. It was her first season running a boat. She was, it was her first time towing in really rough weather. Uh, she called up a few uh, people that she'd met through the network, and they sort of talked her through some strategies mm. to successfully fish, and she ended up having a good day on the water. So. Good. Well, let me ask a related question, and this is for either you or Ms. Bonnie or Mr. Fields. You know, there's a lot of talk about um, barriers to entry in the, in the, you know, commercial fleet, whether it's because of the high uh, costs, upfront costs of financing a boat and gear and quota, um, or um, just the next generation, right, who don't have that, those resources. What are there things that we can be looking at, whether it's in the MSA reauthorization or beyond, that can help, uh, help that issue, particularly in, you know, communities like um, 
where the two of you reside, uh, Mr. Fields and Ms. Bonnie in, in Kodiak. And, you know, I think that's a incredible community. Can you talk about the fishing fleet and how important that is, not only in, in Kodiak, but other coastal communities on the island, and this issue of barriers to entry? And I am probably going to give you a different answer than you expect. No, I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm asking these because I know there might be different views, which is the whole point of the hearing. So, so I think, first of all, you need to understand that the community of Kodiak is very diverse. And so we have, we're kind of the black and white of any fishing community because we have many um, participants in the fishery that are involved in the state fisheries, particularly salmon. And then we have a large um, group of the community that's involved in the federal fisheries. So my life is mostly involved in the federal fisheries because I work for the trawl industry. Uh, and that industry brings 20% of all jobs to Kodiak. which So it's an important group for, and we are seeing a lot of new participants in the fishery just because you're seeing um, if you, Magnuson happened at Americanization in 86, and so a lot of those people are silver-haired, like I'm working on, and leaving the industry, and so new people are bringing, coming in, and who is coming in are the sons and daughters of the owners of the vessels, and the operators and the crew member that are working on the back deck that have um, experienced some expertise. But in uh, my industry right now, we have a, um, a race for fish and vi fishery environment for the trial participants, that, which is um, not as sophisticated as in the Bering Sea, yet we have a lot of restrictions in terms of bycatch. And so. And can, you, can you explain that term? It's used a lot, and I just want you know, other senators who are going to be looking at this transcript and their staff as we talk about the broader issues, what, what, what that term means when you talk about the race to fish and how that impacts sustainability, safety, you know, um, successful management. So, so that I think that it's just because I have these conversations with my family, I'll just put it this way. So if you have a pie and you put the pie in the middle of the table and, it, the only, and everybody's got a fork and the goal is to get the, so a race for fish is trying to get the most pie that you can before your neighbor eats more than you do. The, the, the catch share program basically, or allocate to individuals or cooperatives, basically cuts that pie up into individual pieces, and each participant that has a fork at the table gets a slice of the pie. And then you can choose to eat that as slowly or as fast as you want and whenever you want. So it just creates more um, reason within the way that you're harvesting and, and uh, gives you more tools to make a business plan out of it. So coming back to the issue of um, next generation participants, there's a lot of uncertainty in the industry that I work for because of the system that we're operating under. So they're less likely to be able to get bank loans and enter the fisheries in that way. So for, uh, for the industry that I work for, we'd like more certainty and more ability to get the fish out of the water and have a, a, a business plan versus the system that we live in now. Now for Duncan's groups and for Shannon's, I think their uh, opinion is different than mine. Duncan, do you want to comment, uh, Mr. Fields? Uh, just on any of those questions I well, mentioned. Thank you. I, is the mic on? Yeah. Um, I like Julie's uh, pie uh, metaphor or analogy, but what she didn't amplify is that once those um, pieces are cut, first of all, they're not all even pieces. And then only those people initially allocated a piece of the pie ever get to eat dessert. That's the barrier to entry that creates the graying of the fleet and the problem for young fishermen. That's it. That's what we're facing whether or not it was a state of Alaska limited entry program or a federal um, IFQ program or a uh, LAP program, Bering Sea Crab, for example, each one of those programs creates barriers to entry. And that's 
an aspect, now there's many positive aspects, economic gains, efficiency, safety at sea, not to minimize the positives, but I don't think we as a nation have fully appreciated some of the downstream long-term effects from these limited access programs, particularly in terms of young fishermen entering the fishery. And so in response to my experience in these rural communities, they've been excluded in large part from some of the salmon fisheries because of the permit process from most of the federal fisheries because of either the LLPs, the permits, or specifically lack of quota share. And now their dads are dying or died, and they don't have any continuity in terms of uh, teaching and training. For example, the community of Uzinki, the recent sociological study of the uh, survey of the high school in Uzinki, out of 20 kids, only one thought that he had a, fi a future in fisheries. This is a community that one generation ago Everybody in the community participated in the fisheries. In one generation, you've lost fishing in that community. That's the problem, Mr. So let me, let me ask, and I, I want to get back to Mr. Uh, Carroll, but let me ask a related question. In Bristol Bay, nearly 60% of the permits are now issued to non-Alaskans. So how, so this, and that's a trend that you're kind of touching on in terms of permits leaving Alaska's communities. I'm the chairman of this committee. I'm looking nationally, but of course I'm Alaska senator, and I uh, that that trend, that stat um, causes concern for me. What what are ways that we can undertake to address that kind of trend? I think we straddle two worlds, the state permit world through limited entry, and I think that statistic is more reflective of the state limited entry permit issue. I don't know that we can solve that issue through Magnuson. No, I know. But there's, I'm, there's I'm not parallel, saying it's necessarily There's parallel Magnuson. permits in Magnuson called LLPs, and uh, I think we, we need to look for opportunities for transitional LLPs, for people uh, to fish for a certain number of years under a provisional LLP, and then transition into the fishery. Some of these shoulder kinds of provisions may enable uh, participation in the fishery within the, the, within the federal sphere. But, but that trend is continuing. Uh, it, it, it is alarming uh, for us that believe rural Alaska should have an economy, probably should be a fishing economy. And I think within the state system, uh, there have been some uh, representatives trying to look at the limited entry program to also provide sort of shoulder opportunities for people to transition in to limited entry permits. There's a great program back to the CDQs, great program that the CDQs have to help young people finance Bristol Bay permits, uh, maybe some of the other CDQs as well. Um, that's not available in the Gulf of Alaska because we don't have that economic base of a CDQ program. Did you have a comment, uh, Mr. Carroll? Yeah, just, uh, and I'll be brief, but, I, you know, um, getting back to your original question, I, I think for a lot of people, fishing is a way of life, but at the end of the day, it's, it's still a business. So I think Congress needs to do the best it can to make sure that it's an attractive business to invest into. And I think the way that you do that is to ensure that the, you know, the Reauthorized Act uh, allows for managers to sustainably manage their fisheries and requires that of them. Um, and then just lastly, the, as far as what the act can do to, to sort of break down some of those barriers uh, to, to entry, I think um, there's a lot in it already that empowers the councils to do that. I think if you look back at some of the uh, hearings for the 2006 act, though, um, there was a lot of attention paid to whether or not to, to allow, to lift the moratorium on catcher programs. And I think what you see under 303A in the LAP provisions was really an attempt to sort of bridge the gap between the a lot of the benefits that come with catcher programs and a lot of the negative economic consequences for, and socioeconomic consequences in communities. And I think uh, Mr. Fields pointed out that in 10 years, no fishing community has received an allocation under that provision. And, um, and that was a really big provision in allowing uh, Congress to lift the moratorium. So I think considering what you can do to, to really rework that and to sort of honor the original intent of that provision would be a, a way forward. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Um, and just to follow up on that, I would note that um, NIMS actually wrote a document that explains how to do a sustainability plan. So you may, if you're going to go down that um, route, you may want to look at that and see what uh, is in there and what might be missing. Great. Uh, Ms. Swanson, I wanted to turn to you. You know, there was a, the uh, earlier the discussion on, you know, the issue of classified areas of um, 
overfish stocks that might not relate to directly to overfishing. Can you discuss the effects of the precautionary management and whether or not you think that um, we talk about overfish stocks at any um, under harvesting of stocks is, a, is occurring or do you think that the system and the data and the way in which the council is working is avoiding that issue? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's an interesting question. Uh, regarding the uh, precautionary principle, I think the idea is sound, mm -hmm. that if you don't have adequate information, then you tread very lightly until you do. Where it becomes a problem is where you can't get the information. And that's, I think, why you've heard loud and clear that we need the surveys, because yeah. if, if our survey information ages, then the ACLs are going to drop because we're uncertain. As far as under harvesting, it's arguable that we are. I mean, the, the Bering Sea has a two million ton cap, which some people believe is arbitrary. Some people believe it's important to the conservation of the system. What do you I, believe? You know, not I to put you on the spot. No, I, and it, not speaking for MCA on well, this. Well, I've asked this uh, question a lot on no, the that's cap, okay. right? That's it's, okay. a, it's an important question, and and you know when you're when it's statutorily defined and hasn't been reviewed, I think it's a legitimate question to ask. And it, again, not speaking on behalf of MCA, but myself, I think putting absolute numbers out for anything is generally not a good idea because you don't know what the right number is. You should have the flexibility to find out what it is. Uh, I think having an extremely conservative program in the North Pacific has benefited our stocks, yeah. but it has done that likely at the cost of under harvesting. Um, and that, depending on how you view that, that could be a good or a bad thing. I certainly wouldn't advocate lifting the cap altogether, no. at least not in one one step. I think we have to be very, very careful because you don't know the consequences to other parts of the ecosystem or other fisheries. Uh, but generally, I think my, my overall feeling is that we're in a, a very fluid environment, not to make a pun, but you know, we're in uh, an environment where the, the fisheries are changing, the makeup of the, the fisheries are changing, fish are moving. Uh, we heard about halibut moving offshore. Uh, we've had surveys that have, have shown anomalous results. Uh, to have a, a static regulation in that kind of environment is not a good idea. So flexibility, 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 I think is important. Great. Uh, Ms. Ogilvie, can, uh, the, can you explain a little bit more the concept of alternative management and um, whether you know that's something that your association is supportive of? I'm not an expert on the nuances of the Management Act itself. We are looking for ways to benefit what we're trying to do as a community, which is increase participation. In outdoor recreation as a whole, there's a national effort um, to increase participation, and for us specifically on the recreational fishing side. We, um, it's part of our, it's one of our top priorities of ASA and other organizations such as the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, state fish and wildlife agencies, and federal land man management agencies, in particular the U.S. Forest Service, are partnering with us on that effort. And we hope that in the federal marine fisheries management space, there is an opportunity to be a partner to perhaps it is alternative management uh, policies and, and actions to really focus on the trend of growing more anglers because we want, the, we want them to keep pace with how successful we are already being. So thank you. Okay. Well, listen, I'm going to um, ask if there's any other uh, uh, final comments with regard to um, the witnesses here. And uh, again, if you, if you have a final statement or 
area of emphasis you want to leave a, leave the leave the committee with. Uh, welcome any final comments before we close out this third and final panel. So I'll, again, I'll open it up to the panel for any other final comments uh, you may you may wish to make. Mr. Fields. Mr. Chairman, I have a real sense of urgency relative to the rural communities in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, you've been in a number of those communities. You've been to Old Harbor. Um, you know, Old Harbor, 20 years ago or, or 35 years ago when I went down there in high school with my wrestling buddies, was a vibrant fishing community. It still has a number of boats in the harbor. All but one of those skippers are over 50 years old. Hmm. I just, in my closing comments, this isn't abstract to me. Changing the community provisions in Magnuson will affect real people that I know, families and communities that I'm engaged with, and it's very important. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Ms. Swanson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'm repeating what probably what Mr. Reed mentioned earlier, that sound, verifiable science is key to fisheries management. You, you receive data from a lot of different sources, from fishermen on the water who see this every day, from universities, from federal research, and all of that data has value. But before it's incorporated into a management system, I think you need to do a very rigorous review of how the data was collected. Has it been peer reviewed? Is it repeatable? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would be very concerned about lowering the bar for the, the standard of science that we use right now to be more inclusive. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Bonnie? I, I guess I'm going to speak to one of the other issues that was brought up for the other two panels, and that is um, observer coverage. Yeah. And so uh, the, Gulf, the North Pacific has a very unique program through the partial coverage sector. Um, what's happening is that that was a human coverage pool. Now we're integrating the EM side of the pool and our funding sources is diminished, and all of it's coming self-funded through fishermen, uh, taxing fishermen and processors. Yeah. We need help with funding for that program. Well, we're gonna look at that because I think, you know, my understanding of that is that right now it's not equitable in terms of how it's applied in other regions. And if another region pays for it through federal funds, then my view is, uh, we should have a similar opportunity to receive that kind of support. So we will be looking at that hard, but thank you for raising that. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Carroll. I just want to say thank you for holding this hearing in Alaska, and uh, we appreciate your support. So Absolutely. You. Great. Ms. Ogilvy, anything? The same. Um, we are all very appreciative, and, and conservation is the top of mind, fishing top of mind, keeping our waters clean, abundant with fish, and having access to them. Thank you. Great. Well, again, I want to, uh, in conclusion, want to thank all the witnesses. Uh, I think everybody who's remained, you've been a very uh, patient audience, but um, I think you've seen we've had three great panels, very informative, different views, which, of course, we knew that was going to happen. Um, I also want to mention the hearing record will remain open for two weeks. Uh, during this time, uh, other senators on the committee may be submitting records, or I'm sorry, questions for the record to any of the uh, three panel witnesses. So we ask respectfully that if you uh, do receive a question from another senator, uh, that the witnesses are requested to submit their written answers to the committee as soon as uh, practicable. Um, I want to thank the witnesses for appearing again today. I also want to leave an email for anyone else who wants to submit uh, their um, record of, of testimony to the committee on this topic. The email is uh, to a committee staffer, chance, C-A-C-H-A-N-C-E -C -C -E underscore Costello, C-O-S-T-E-L-L-O at Commerce. Senate.gov. And uh, again, appreciate uh, 
the panelists. I've certainly learned a lot and look forward to uh, continuing to gauge with all the different stakeholders here um, on this very, very important topic as we move forward. This hearing is adjourned.